Okay, good evening everybody! Welcome back to Exploring the Lord of the Rings. Uh, I am here on the Gladden server today in Lotro. Uh, and uh, glad to see everybody back again. Um, I was only away one week, and that was a week ago now, but I still, like, it takes me a while to get adjusted to, uh, you know, being back. So, anyway, here we are! Uh, I, keep, I keep finding myself still wanting to say welcome back. Um, glad you guys could join us. I hope that uh, I've got everything set up properly today and that things will more or less behave. Um, uh, okay, good. Excellent. All right. So tonight, so first of all, let me apologize. Uh, as some of you will have noticed if you follow our social media threads, or if you, if you have indeed tried on your own to get to Signum University or Mythgard uh, uh, Institute's websites over the last couple days, uh, we've been having some troubles. Our server, just like our, uh, our uh, hosting service, just like basically failed um so we had a, what i think was the longest prolonged outage of our website in my, perhaps in signum's history that was a really long one anyway one of the consequences of course was during that time we couldn't get to the forums uh so the website is back up now i'm delighted to say uh many kudos to uh our uh, uh wonderful uh people who have been working hard behind the scenes to make that happen so that finally happened, but it was too late for my class prep, which I had already done. And so when I was doing my preparation for class, as usual, every week, um, I w wasn't able to see people's posts. So I'm sure there are many excellent, wonderful posts on the discussion boards, but I wasn't able to see them while I was preparing for class. So tonight, we're not going to have notes and queries. Uh, we'll have to probably do more of that next week, which means... Um, uh, we're going to uh, get through more text than usual. <laughs> Last week, we only did one slide of actual text uh, because we had so many questions and stuff that we were talking about. Uh, so um, uh, this uh, this week, we'll see if we can uh, make up for it. I know, right? Three slides is my goal trifle. We'll see. We'll see. I think, JJ, we might get a couple paragraphs in. Um and in particular, what I'm really excited about for today, so uh, the, the, it's not just the mere quantity, of course, of text that we'll be covering, um, but this, these few paragraphs that we're doing today are paragraphs I've been really excited to get to. For one thing, these are paragraphs that people have been <laughs> wanting to jump forward and talk about for a really long time. Just like the passage where Gandalf talks about you saw him, uh, you know, as he is on the other side, right? People have been quoting that for months, right? During Ever since Glorfindel showed up, people have been quoting that. And I'm like, wait till we get there to get there. Similarly, people have been quoting the that Gandalf's reflections on Frodo and him being, you know, uh, uh, like a glass and everything. That passage that we're going to get to tonight, people have been quoting that and I've been kind of pushing that back and, and, and waiting. Um, so we're going to get to that tonight. But it's not only that we're going to get to that particular passage, but even the passage before that, the theme tonight uh, is... We're going to get a kind of insight. We're going to learn more about Gandalf, I think, in tonight's paragraphs uh, than we have perhaps in the whole book so far. And I think that's really interesting. We're going to get what I think might be the only Gandalf point of view section, like in the entire text, I think. Um, I can't remember any other time when the narrative really goes inside Gandalf's head. We hear him sometimes telling us what's going on in his head, uh, right? But to actually hear what Gandalf is thinking, I don't know that that happens. Uh, uh, and, it, you know, I, yeah. So anyway, it's very unusual uh, and I think very striking and cool. Uh, so we are, um, uh, we're going to be, we're going to be getting to that. But again, even more than that is what comes before. So, uh, we will jump into that in a second. Quick first, a few announcements because there's so much stuff going on. Uh, this is a really exciting time. Uh, first, 
uh, don't forget, I, I announced this last week and explained it, and you can look it up uh, for yourself. I'm not going to go over it and show you the page again, uh, even though we can now because the site's back up. Uh, Moodcast, don't forget about Moodcast. So the, we have until we have until after the first week of June. So June 8th, I think, is the date uh, when we have to close registrations for MythMoot. So. If you can attend MythMoot yourself, you absolutely should should come. Um, you have until June 8th to register, so we, we have about one more month of registration for that. So if you haven't yet, get on that. You should come. But if you can't attend in person, that's okay because we have... Um, uh, because we have uh, MootCast now. We have our, our first ever total... Uh, live video coverage of MythMoot for those who can't make it and can still join us virtually. So that's going to be a lot of fun. I'm really looking forward to to that happening and being available for the first time. Uh, so make sure that you check that out if you haven't yet. Um, the other thing that I wanted to uh, uh, I was going to say remind people of, but I haven't announced it yet. Um, this week, of course, is kind of a fun week. The Tolkien movie, uh, the biopics, uh, comes out this week in the theaters. Um, which I liked again. I, I actually, I mean, I, I hesitate to recommend it cause I'm sure a lot of people won't like it. Uh, but I actually really liked it. I'm looking forward to seeing it again. I'm hoping to see it again this weekend. I'm planning to go on Friday. Um, so, uh, uh, but anyway, in sort of celebration of the, you know, Tolkien biography that is, uh, uh coming out in the theaters in America this weekend, uh, we're doing a, a special on our, uh, anytime audit, enrollment for Tolkien's Wars in Middle-earth. That's the class that John Garth taught. Uh, it's a, a course that was essentially sort of an expansion of based on sort of the the uh, largely based on the material that he covered in his wonderful book, Tolkien and the Great War, which I'm in the middle of rereading in preparation for seeing the film again. So, um, uh, anyway, I, so I've I've like have like John Garth's voice freshly in my in my ear right as I've been listening to him all day long today. Um, but uh, anyway, so uh, wonderful course that he taught for us. So you can get uh, the the special promotional rate seventy five dollar anytime audit registration uh, for um, uh, for Tolkien Wars and Middle Earth that will go through the nineteenth of May. That's starting now and or it's already going and will go through the nineteenth of May. So. Uh, you can get in on that. Uh, and then, uh, oh, yeah, yeah, that is the wrong thumbnail, but the right link there in Discord. Anyway, there you go. Um, so the other thing that I wanted to point out is that we are almost ready for the transition uh, in the Mythgard Academy. We have one more week of talking about King Arthur stuff. Uh, and uh, then next week we're going to start Sauron Defeated. So we're going back to the history of Middle-earth. Uh, those of you who have been coming along, hope you'll continue with us in our journey through the history of Middle-earth, which has been such an amazing learning experience over the last few years for me. Uh, I have so much enjoyed that, and I can't wait to go through the end of the, the history of the Lord of the Rings and the Notion Club papers with you guys. It's going to be awesome. Uh, so that's going to start on the 15th next Wednesday. But this Wednesday, that is to say tomorrow night on May 8th, we're going to do a discussion of Monty Python and the Holy Grail uh, at, at the end of, you know, the greatest Arthurian adaptation of the 20th century um, uh, in uh, our... Um, uh, uh, as the, the, the end of our, our Maori uh, course. So you can join us for that tomorrow night, 10 p.m. Eastern time. Um, it's the greatest one just of the 20th century. Well, yeah, I mean, you know, I think uh, I think it could, um, uh, you know, you could make an argument. <laughs> you could make an argument. Uh, I certainly, there certainly hasn't been anything in the 21st century that's better than it, I can tell you. Um, and yes, Tony, thanks for the spoiler. You're right. Sauron does lose in the Lord of the Rings as implied in the title. Um, but of course, Sauron is defeated in more than one way, right? Um, because of course we have lots of Numenor stuff in that volume as well. So we get Sauron defeated on multiple fronts, uh, here during volume nine of the history of Middle Earth. Anyway, um, so that's, um, uh, that's, that's what's happening this coming week. Um, it's our first week of classes here at uh, Signum in our summer term. So if you were hoping to join or uh, audit one of our courses, there's still time for that. Um, courses have just started up here yesterday and today. Uh, registration will still be open until the 19th, but sooner is better, of course, when it comes to that. So, all right. I think that's all the news tonight. Uh, so let's, um, uh, let's, uh, move, uh, 
Let's move on here. Okay. Um, excellent. Um, <laughs> Sauron taunts Middle Earth a second time. It's almost the other way around, actually. But okay, very good. Then let us move on to the text. So. Remember that we were discuss one of the things, one of the issues that we were discussing, one of the things that was raised by uh, some of the folks on the discussion board that we were looking at, um, that I said we would come back to today, was the question of Gandalf's power and Sauron's power, right? And to what extent are they opposite numbers? What's, what's the difference between how good people exert power right, utilize power, or what hobbits might call magic in the world, and how does it differ from the deceits of the enemy? How does it differ from how power is exerted by the bad guys? Like, how how can you tell? What is the essential difference? Um, and um, one of the things, remember we were talking about this, that, uh, you know, people were wanting to talk about how Gandalf is about inspiring hope and, and uh, uh, sort of spirit in people. But that I was saying we've got to be careful with that because that's something that's not a premise from which Tolkien begins. That's a conclusion to which he comes at the end. Right. Um, so I'm not saying that we can't think about that or we have to try to forget that that Tolkien ever went on to write that. Um, but we shouldn't, I think, approach these passages in The Lord of the Rings with that premise in mind first, looking for confirmation of it or as if that premise informed these passages that premise instead is drawn from these passages right um anyway okay so uh therefore the main thing that i want to uh uh focus on here in this in these passages look at Gan look at what happens with gandalf remember gandalf has just been talking about the war so let me uh i've been uh saving the old passages so I can go back here. So remember, this is what Gandalf had just been saying. Uh, you saw him for a moment as he is upon the other side, one of the mighty of the firstborn. He is an elf lord of a house of princes. Indeed, there is a power in Rivendell to withstand the might of Mordor for a while, and elsewhere other powers still dwell. There is power, too, of another kind in the Shire, but all such places will soon become islands under siege. If things go on as they are going, the Dark Lord is putting forth all his strength. One of the things that we were observing last time about that final paragraph is that um, he it sort of transitions, right? He kind of, uh, uh, he, he starts off talking and still answering the question, is Rivendell safe, right? And, uh, and asking and answering his question about Gorfindel. By the end of the paragraph, he is talking about the War of the Ring to come, right? All such places will soon become islands under siege. If things go on as they are going, the Dark Lord is putting forth all his strength. Um, and we were kind of pointing out that this seems like a sort of questionable from a, from a, from a medical standpoint, right? From a, uh, from a treatment standpoint uh, of, uh, of his patient Frodo. Um, thinking especially from like a spiritual point of view, uh, this is uh, seems like a kind of a questionable move on Gandalf's part. Like, let's keep it positive here, Gandalf, right? Um, but uh, the thing that I want to primarily point out here, look what happens to him. Uh, we've seen where his mind goes, right? But look at what happens to Gandalf when his mind goes there. So let's go back to the beginning here. Still, he said, standing suddenly up and sticking out his chin while his beard went stiff and straight like bristling wire. We must keep up our courage. You will soon be well if I do not talk you to death. You are in Rivendell, and you need not worry about anything for the present. Okay, so two things that we can see happening here, right? First is, by the end of this paragraph, he's come back to the bedside manner, right? He's once again kind of remembering himself in a sense, right? Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, his message in the end, you are in Rivendell and you need not worry about anything for the present. So forget what I was just saying about islands under siege, right? That adds, that's a, let's not focus on that, right? Let's focus on your current safety and that you don't have to worry about 
anything, right? But to me, the really fascinating thing is what we see before that, right? Him standing suddenly up and sticking out his chin and his beard going stiff. Um, I, I, you know, my beard is not long enough to stick out. I find that although I enjoy having a beard long a long beard dry i could never do that i mean although it would be kind of fun to have a beard long enough to be able to tuck into my belt um i drives me crazy so i'm not going to do that and so therefore i can't stick it out like a like straight stiff and straight like bristling wire i don't know if you can do that does anybody else have a prehensile beard um (laughs) <laughs> Matthew was just thinking exactly the same thing. Does Gandalf has a, have a prehensile beard? It's really what it sounds like. Um, however, um, uh, the sticking out of his chin, right, which is presumably what... I, don't, I doubt he's actually moving his beard hairs, right? Um, uh, uh, like Master Eon and uh, Skylanders, Matthias would tell me. Um, but... Um, but anyway, no, I don't think he's actually moving his beard. I think that he is, um, uh, it's, it's the sticking, it's the emphasizing of the sticking out of, standing up and sticking out of his chin, right? Notice his own response, right? Um, when he talks himself around to, um, uh, to the, the thinking about the war to come, and especially remember where he ends, right? The Dark Lord is putting forth all his strength as he brings himself to think about that, as he's now kind of himself looking at the big picture. He's kind of moved past what happened and what does that mean to what's going to happen. What, what you know, not what does it mean in this? Frodo wants to be like, what does it mean in the sense of like what occurred? I don't understand. I'm trying to parse what occurred, right? Gandalf is moving to the future implications, right? This means the war is beginning, right? This means the Dark Lord is putting forth his strength. Um, And his reaction to that is he is invigorated by that, right? Um, This is a pretty striking reaction by Gandalf. We almost never see him responding like this. He remained pretty calm throughout the discussion, for instance, in back end right back in chapter two um when he was like revealing some fairly shocking things to frodo and frodo was having uh, you know a number of fairly strong emotional reactions right to all the big heavy news that gandalf was dropping on him but gandalf himself remained calm throughout right the only time we've ever seen him respond anything like this is when he stands up and says to and and exerts his will on bilbo Right. Um, You'll be a fool if you do, Bilbo. Right. Uh, The whole get off the gray uncloaked section. Um, And I wonder that I wonder. I think we're my suspicion here is that we're getting a little glimpse of Gandalf the gray uncloaked as well here. Right. He's kind of. Showing something here. Um. And I think that it's important. Yeah, Zephan says he's drawn to the we. Is Gandalf also talking up his own courage and, or, and defiance here? Um, he says that he thinks so, uh, that he's sort of vocalizing an inner monologue of sorts. Yeah, I, I, we must keep up our courage. He's... Zephan, I agree that that's... He doesn't say, still, you must keep up your courage. Because notice, of course, Zephan, he immediately shifts to the second person right you will soon be well you are in rivendell you need not worry but he doesn't lead with still you must keep up your courage he says we must keep up our courage right um he he is including himself here uh and i we can see his sort of so what can we see in gandalf here we can see a desire first of all a sense of the significance of this for him right we can already see Gandalf's own the, the 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 kind of reaction that he has to the prospect of the Dark Lord putting forth his strength, right? He is doing the opposite of cowering, the opposite of it. You know, he is he is his response to that is 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 pugnacious, right? Is the the this the 
energy that leads him to, he can't even stay city, s- sitting down, right? He's got to stand up uh, and um, stick out his chin, right? Uh, in defiance. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so... Um, Yeah, that's really interesting. Um, uh, Taweth points out, uh, this is as opposed to The Hobbit, where Gandalf was all like, hey, this is your quest, not mine. Uh, he's in it with them this time. That's a really, really wonderful point uh, and really good to remember, right? In The Hobbit, he does at many points, this is your adventure, not mine, right? Even though, of course, he does, re- d- despite saying that and despite leaving them, he does return to them, right? And hasten back even, uh, to catch, to, to come back in the nick of time uh, at the end. So to some extent, when he's like, oh, you know, whatever, this is not my adventure. I don't 100% believe him there, right? He does seem to be a little bit more invested than he's letting on, both personally and, uh, I don't know what, ideologically, right? Um, but nevertheless, I, I, I certainly agree with you, Tao. I think there's a really important difference that we can see um, uh, here. And uh, 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 Jacques, yeah, this is Gandalf's purpose, right? Um, and I think that's one of the things that, to me, this this mannerism, right, this behavior by Gandalf shows us. This is the one. And remember, this is really the first time we've seen this. Gandalf. We know that Gandalf is opposed to the enemy, right? So is say you know so is uh, Strider, right? So is Gorfindel. So is Elrond. So is. Barlaman Butterbur, right? So is Farmer Maggot. I mean, lots of people are opposed to the enemy, but we have not had any reason to believe yet. This is the first indicator that we get that in some sense, Gandalf's purpose is the opposition of Sauron, right? Um, You know, he is going to say eventually, right, at the end of the Return of the King, once the quest is over, he's going to say, I was the enemy of Sauron, right? Like his job is to be one of the sort of captains of the resistance, right? One of the leaders of the resistance against Sauron. By the end of the of the story, it is going to be clear that that's Gandalf's purpose, that that's Gandalf's role. We have this is I, this is our first hint of that, right? When he as he begins to think about the war that is coming, the war that has begun, and he's like, "I'm ready. Let me at him," right? Um, uh, we must keep up our courage. And so, Zephan, coming back to your point there, I think the we goes both ways, right? That's what I love. About, that, that's what I, the other thing that I love about the inclusiveness of that we. On the one hand, we can see it's relevant to himself, Zephan, exactly as you pointed out, right? He needs to keep up his own courage. His own courage is in doubt, right? I don't mean that his courage is tentative. I mean, it's an issue. It's not automatic, right? Gandalf has a choice to make. He could fail, Right, he could totally screw this up, and he would be screwing this up. What would that look like? It would look like not keeping up his courage. Right, he could back down. He could wimp out. That's that's on the table. Right, he, spoiler, he's not going to do it, but he could. Right, uh, so that he's thinking about that. Um, but uh, but the other thing, Zephan, is it's in addition to that. He's, he's not only including himself. Obviously, he's including Frodo in the we as well. This, I think, is that first indicator also that we get that that is also part of what it means. So this is the first glimpse that we get of Gandalf as leader of the opposition of Sauron. It is also the first glimpse that we get of how he is a leader, right? We must keep up our courage. Um, That would be like a pretty good campaign slogan for Gandalf for president, right? Gandalf for president. We must keep up our courage, right? I mean, that's kind of his thing, right? And we will see, um, you know, a a great deal of Gandalf's future actions in the story is going to be like a kind of extended commentary on that line, right? Um, We must keep up our courage. Uh, Cross-reference. Theoden in the Golden Hall, right? Cross-reference Denethor, right? That one doesn't pan out as well as he doesn't succeed with that one as well as he succeeds with Theoden, but still, right? Um, Yeah, yeah. And Tony, you know, I would not, um, I would not be surprised if the, um, uh, if, if, if you're right about that, if, you know, the, the we is also to reassure Frodo that he, Gandalf, is in the fight with him, right? That Frodo is not alone. 
uh, with his burden. Um, and even, of course, it isn't if you are feeling uh, intimidated and slightly fearful, right? It is kind of encouraging to have this person whom you look up to and respect so much as Frodo does Gandalf say, you and I are in the same boat, right? We both have our courage that we need to keep up. Let's help each other do that, right? So it certainly is a really great leadership moment in that way too, right? Um, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Gandalf wearing a keep calm and carry on shirt. I, I belongs, but I, I agree with you. I think it's more like don't panic, right? Um, Gandalf uh, knows where his towel is. Uh, yeah, good. Um, yeah, no, I agree, uh, 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 Cecilia. That would be a, a really good T-shirt, wouldn't it? Gandalf for president. Uh, on on the front, we must keep up our courage. Um, yeah, 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 exactly. Um, yeah, uh, Jacques, I agree. This is a really big moment uh, for several heroes in the story, right? This whole um, interlude in Rivendell. Uh, you're absolutely right. Very uh, crucial moments for Frodo, Gandalf, and Aragorn. Absolutely, um, and. That's why I find this passage so compelling with Gandalf, because we get this glimpse into what's going on with him, right? What his job is, what his thoughts are, what his fears and concerns are, uh, what his responsibility is, all that kind of stuff um, is I, this is I can't remember another place in the text where we've seen that more clearly than we do here. Um, yeah, yeah. Um Okay, uh, let's see. Um, yeah, that's interesting. Uh, De La Mancha points out that uh, it's, it's similar to the kind of inclusive wording that Aragorn often used, too, when he would say things like, let us take this as a sign. Um, yeah, yeah, that's interesting. Um, I hadn't been thinking about Aragorn's use of the plural in that way, uh, when when really he was saying, "Okay, I'm gonna take this as a sign. Just you guys, just come along, right?" Um, and, but but you're right; he didn't talk that way with them. Um, I wonder. Katrin is asking if we think that there we're seeing any vague hints here that Gandalf is still a bit rattled uh, from his recent encounter with Saruman, which of course we don't know about yet. Um, and not just about being daunted by the task of, task of going up against Sauron. Um, I don't know. I don't know if there's any evidence of his, of his being rattled exactly. Again, I don't... Th I mean, we must keep up our courage. We don't know how much he's actually struggling with keeping up his courage, right? Um, if we were seeing real doubt in him, then I might think that way, Katriana? I'm not sure that we have clear evidence that he's actually doubting himself, or himself seriously worried. Um, again, if anything, he seems to be kind of pumped up uh, in response to the thought of the Dark Lord putting forth all his strength. Um, in fact, Katriana, I guess I would say kind of in <laughs> looking forward to what he's going to tell us about what happened retroactively in the past, uh, if anything, it seems like the treason of Isengard is again like a, a clear sign that the beginning has come, right? Um, yeah, yeah, exactly, Tony. The the resurfaced the ring and the Nazgul coming in, and again, even I think I would add even the treason of Isengard to that. That that now is the time, right? The time of doom uh, has come. I think that's absolutely right. Um. That's interesting. Fourth Dauntless is saying that he's uh, he thinks it's a little bit conspicuous that we don't know in what direction he's sticking out his chin and his beard. Right? Is he is he facing the east defiantly when he says that? Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I, I agree. It's interesting that we don't get that. I don't know that I would say it's sort of. I, I don't know that I would say it's strange that we don't get that, but it is kind of interesting. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, exactly. Cecilia and someone else is asking about, you know, isn't this just kind of like the royal we? Um, 
but I agree. The reason I think that it's not just a sort of figure of speech like that, to me, it's very conspicuous given the shift, right? How in the next sentence he shifts to saying you. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, cool. Um, yeah, interesting. Jacques says, of course, his encounter with Saruman would make him realize that he was the one sticking to the mission, right? <laughs> he's, 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 I mean, because Jacques, you, he could be daunted by that, right? Because there's more, um, there's more that is uh, kind of on his shoulders now, right? Because it's clear that Saruman has at least abdicated his job, right, as uh, uh, leader of the council. Um, at the very least, he is not doing what he's meant to do, and he's obviously also doing a bunch of things that he's not supposed to do. So he is now doing the opposite of helping, uh, and so it's up to Gandalf, right? Um, yes, yes. Um, yeah, good, good. Um, okay. You will soon be well if I do not talk you to death. Uh, it's interesting that he, his he immediate his, his immediate response, like the the, the next stage, right after. I, I I think kind of uncloaking himself a little bit here, right? That like the chin's a dead giveaway, right? As he sort of reveals his own thought, his own passion, his own role, and I think even to some extent his own power. Uh, he's sort of pointing in that direction with the "we must keep up our courage," uh, and then he immediately says something. Uh, self -de self deprecating uh, in a sort of hobbitish kind of way, right? You will soon be well if I do not talk you to death. Um, uh, it's uh, I think it's a very interestingly un self aggrandizing thing to say, right? In this particular moment, um, uh, you are in Rivendell, and you need not worry about anything for the present. This that sounds like Gandalf finally coming to so like okay um, so I got a little distracted there right but that's the answer to your question because remember the question was is Rivendell safe right uh, l short answer yes yes you are in Rivendell and you need not worry about anything for the present um, um, absolutely absolutely um, I haven't any courage to keep up said Frodo. But I am not worried at the moment. Just give me news of my friends, and tell me the end of the affair at the ford, as I keep on asking, and I shall be content for the present. After that, I shall have another sleep, I think. But I shan't be able to close my eyes until you have finished the story for me. Um. Yeah, the apocalypse is coming, but don't worry just now, uh, Tony says. Yes, um... And I, but I love Frodo's response, how Frodo responds by teasing him uh, uh, back again, right? Um, yes, you're threatening. On the one hand, Gandalf, you're threatening to talk me to death. But yet, for all this talking, you've not answered my question, right? I keep asking you to tell me what happened at the Ford. Uh, and you were like, no, I shouldn't say that. Well, you, you might as well have told me because you've been talking all, uh, all this time. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, so I, I again, I like the way that we can see Frodo gently teasing him. Um, again, this is it's worth noting again, Frodo and Gandalf's relationships. You can always tell by the way in which they insult each other how close friends they are, right? Uh, if you're really comfortable with someone, you tease and insult them. That's clearly the way things work, right? We we can uh, we know it's 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 a very British thing, but it's a very Hobbit thing, certainly. Um, and, um, uh, I think it's important to be reminded, right? That Gandalf and Frodo have that kind of relationship. We don't see, it's going to take a while. Remember we saw Aragorn kind of slowly warming up in this direction, right? Um, we talked about this a little bit with the stone trolls, right? And, uh, how Aragorn kind of plays them, right? And, and plays this practical joke on them, which they love, Right. And that seems to lead to this moment of friendship and fellowship among them, not just among the hobbits, but with Aragorn as well, um, which is different from any of the interactions that we've seen them have 
with Aragorn before that. Gandalf's already a pro, though, right? We already see this kind of intimacy that he has with Frodo, and I think it's really, uh, uh, I think it's really fun. Um, yeah. Um, now, Rococo, I agree with you. It is, um, it is important not to miss the basic truth and, and significance of what the advice that Gandalf gives to Frodo, right? One day at a time, right? Uh, you know, to use Tony's phrase, the apocalypse might be coming, but it's not today, right? The Dark Lord is putting forth all of his power, but you're safe for, for now, right? So don't worry. Um, and I don't think... It, it is easy to make that sound like a joke or kind of sarcastic, right? right Tony, exactly the kind of emphasis that you are placing on that. Um, and that's, that's, that's funny, but I don't think that that's how Gandalf means it, right? I don't think he's um, making fun of himself again by saying that. I think that I, th I agree with Rococo. I think this is genuine advice, right? Um, uh, the Dark Lord is putting forth all his strength. Um, we must keep up our courage. We're going to fight and resist to the last. Um, but you're a Rivendell, right? Don't worry. Um, you need not worry about anything for the present. Um, Stephanie is wondering how much Frodo actually wants to know about his situation. Stephanie, are you wondering if the, 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 Movement into the Dark Lord is putting forth all his strength is perhaps too much information for Frodo. He's like, no, I, I really just wanted to know that Merry and Pippin were okay. Like, you know, is that, you know, can I, how, how did they escape and, and what happened to the, to the, to the Black Riders? Um, yeah, yeah. Um, and Tony, you're absolutely right. That is a good thing to remember, uh, that, um, uh, we are also seeing Frodo's hobbit res resilience, right? Thinking of how gravely wounded Frodo was. I mean, he was this close to wraithification. Uh, he's just come back from, uh, the, like, the, the edge of destruction physically and spiritually, right? He's just now, re you know, he's awoken for the first time. Uh, and to see him, uh, uh, you know, banter with Gandalf right away shows how thoroughly he has bounced back right um yeah yeah um yeah yeah um okay yeah uh pastille i agree uh uh hobbit courage is really important right it really can do a lot of things and it's easy to overlook it right um because, again, this is how Frodo normally talks, but I do think it is important to remember the significance of the fact that Frodo is having a totally normal conversation, right? He's, he, he, he went, he's come back from the edge and is, is fine now, right? Everything's okay. Uh, and that's pretty striking, as Gandalf himself is going to be reflecting on in a moment. Um, let's, um, here's the... Gandalf passage everyone's been wanting to talk about. Okay, actually, hang on. Wait, we were almost about to do another slide, but then Fourth Dauntless asked another question, which is a good one. What does Frodo mean by, I don't have any courage to keep up? He can't mean it literally, can he? That is clearly, um, I mean, on the one hand, that's an even more self-deprecating statement than anything that Gandalf said, right? Um, it's manifestly untrue, as you point out, that he doesn't... Ha I mean, he has lots of courage, right? But he doesn't feel that he has any courage. I don't think he's being... I don't think this is false modesty on Frodo's part. I think this is a real reflection of how he feels. Um, emotionally exhausted Arden Crayon, that sounds right. Uh, I think that's... Uh, um, that seems to me very sensible yes drained luke exactly um uh his courage tank is empty yeah or at least he feels it to be so right and again even in saying this uh, it, it, ironically uh as uh as we were just discussing 
the fact that he's able to have this kind of conversation with Gandalf right away at this point shows great resilience on his part, right? Um, he is not nearly as weak and empty and, uh, you know, sort of unable to resist or, you know, I have no courage to keep up. Um, uh, it's, we see in this, in, in the act of saying this, in this very paragraph, he shows it to be untrue, but I think it's clearly how he, how he feels, right? Um, and Matt, I agree that hobbits, none of the hobbits really do seem to notice that they are courageous. Um, uh, yeah. Um, If you think about this kind of culturally, right? I, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to think of a contrast, right? Um, I'm trying to think of a contrast to that kind of cur- the kind of courage that hobbits have without just coming to somebody who's arrogant, right? Somebody who's a negative example, somebody who's a positive example in, within a different culture. Uh, and the best that I can come up with is Boromir. Um, Boromir is brave and he knows that he's brave. Uh, and he, I think under certain circumstances would even boast that he was brave. Um, but the hobbits would be very brave, but it would never even occur. Uh, it it would never even occur to them to think of themselves as brave. Right. Um, think about Sam, uh, saying that he doesn't want to be, he doesn't want to be neither, right? When it comes to being a, a wizard or a warrior, right? Um, uh, he doesn't want to be a, you know, absolutely not. Um, yeah, Lincoln, you into Boromir too? Yeah, yeah, no, uh, yes. Boromir embraces bravery. The Rohirrim embrace bravery. Amir knows he's brave, right? He doesn't have any problem with that. Um Tony, I agree with you. It's all about, um, it's all about their humility. It's part of the, 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 the humility that seems to be endemic in hobbits. It's one of the reasons why hobbits are a little people, not just in stature, right? And it's one of the things that most importantly makes hobbits the perfect ring bearers, right? Um, Frodo is the best choice to carry the ring of power. Um, and as we can see, we, we know spoilers, right? Um, uh, he is not going to, uh, Boromir would not be able to resist the ring. Right. Um, and I think there's a correlation there between the kind of, the kind of humility that Frodo has and that same, and Boromir not having that kind of humility. Right. And I think that that particular, I'm not necessarily saying that the embracing of one's own bravery is necessarily bad. I don't think that that's a vice in Boromir. I don't think that that's a vice in the Rohirrim when they boast of deeds that they are going to accomplish or something like that. I don't think that Tolkien disapproves of that morally, but I think that he does approve, you know, he does want to make the point that there is that strength, right, that hobbits have. That humility is, is, is a strength for them. And I, I definitely think that that's what we're seeing here. Um, he really doesn't understand um, the courage that he has or that he's shown. Remember back to the beginning of this conversation when Gandalf uh, immediately begins by teasing him about uh, how many absurd things he's done during his journey. And he immediately thinks about the Barrow Downs. Right. Gandalf mentions the Barrow Downs and he's th- he's like, oh, man, yeah, I really blew it. Right. Several times here. Um, but of course, he's not thinking as we saw. I mean, the kind of courage the narrator had to draw our attention, re- drew our attention really forcibly. Right. To the the kind of courage, that seed of courage that is buried deeply in hobbits. Right. Which emerges uh, the extravagant courage that Frodo showed in the Barrow Downs. Uh, to uh, hew the 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 hand uh, of the uh, of the Barrow White and and uh, uh, you know work against his curse and then call out for Tom Bombadil, um, 
he showed remarkable courage. And yet Frodo immediately was like, oh yeah, like absurd. I, I really screwed that up, right? He, he doesn't, you know, he doesn't even think of his courage as a moderating factor, right? He's like, oh yeah, okay, I did lots of absurd things. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, Morna, when that's really interesting, what about Aragorn? I think that Aragorn... I would say the difference between Aragorn and Boromir. I don't think it's necessarily that they have totally different, like, codes or sort of moral frameworks on this subject. I just get the feeling that Aragorn's much older than Boromir is. Um, and I think he's the, the gap in experience between them is even greater than the gap in age between him and Boromir in the sense that Boromir, though he's seen battle and he's, you know, he's not sheltered or anything like that. Um, but you know, he's the prince, not officially the prince, right? But he's the sort of prince. Um, Aragorn has had a rougher life and more varied experiences. And I think that we can see that what I'm getting at is Aragorn has failed more often, right? Aragorn does not seem as confident as Boromir just because I think he's been through more than Boromir has. Um, but I don't think that he has any less of a, uh, I, 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 I don't think that he has that Hobbit flavor of humility that we see in Frodo and in Sam, of course, very, very strongly. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, Fourth Dauntless is thinking of the conversation between Pippin and Baragond, where we will see that issue with courage and bravery again, uh, and Pippin voicing a very similar thing. Yes, yes. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, good. Um, Yeah, Pippin is the youngest. You're right, um, Tom. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, that's interesting, Tony. Well, we'll we'll we can look at we'll get more chances to look at Aragorn and Boromir. We shouldn't get too distracted by them as they're not in this passage, right? Let's keep our focus on Gandalf and Frodo. Um, but uh, but 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 yes, I, I agree with a lot of the things that you guys are saying. I think it's important. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, that is, though, okay, last co comment. Cecilia, I agree that that is interesting. Boromir is brave and wants to know, wants others to know how brave he is, whereas Aragorn knows that he's brave, but doesn't need to broadcast that, right? Yeah, yeah, no, that seems fair to me, too. Um, anyway, cool. Yeah, we'll, we'll get back to, you're right, Tony, and the council will get the two of them together, and we'll get lots of opportunities to compare and contrast uh, Aragorn and Boromir there. Um, but anyway, now, whoops, really on to, uh, uh, the next slide. Gandalf moved his chair to the bedside and took a good look at Frodo. So Frodo, remember, has just said, uh, I shan't be able to close my eyes until you finish the story for me. So this is Gandalf seeing, all right, is this really okay? Right? This is a, this is a diagnostic moment for Gandalf, right? He took a good look at Frodo. The color had come back to his face, and his eyes were clear and fully awake and aware. He was smiling, and there seemed to be little wrong with him. But to the wizard's eye, there was a faint change, just a hint, as it were, of transparency about him, and especially about the left hand that lay outside upon the coverlet. Still, that must be expected, said Gandalf to himself. He is not half through yet. And to, tell, and to what he will come in the end, not even Elrond can foretell. Not to evil, I think. He may become like a glass filled with a clear light for eyes to see that can. Okay. Mad Violinist, excellent first question. I was thinking the same thing. Who wrote this, right? Who is narrating this? Um, uh... Votes. Let's play our narrator game. Frodo or Sam? Frodo or Sam, do you think, here? Uh, 
Lots of votes for Frodo. Crownless says, the heart is like Sam, the language is like Frodo. <clears throat> There's no question that Frodo could have written this. I'm not, I don't, I wouldn't question that on practical grounds. No question that he and Gandalf could have talked, you know, Gandalf could have confessed all this to him later on, right? And then he included this. My, I think Sam. I, I would vote for Sam. And here's the reason I would vote for Sam. Um, Sam himself is going to be reflecting on Frodo in a very similar way um, later on. Well, we will see Sam reflecting on Frodo um, a couple of times in these sorts of ways. And... I think that this is a conversation that I can imagine. I can imagine Gandalf having this conversation with Frodo. I can imagine Sam initiating this conversation with Gandalf. Um, I, but this strikes me as something that Sam would care about more than Frodo, right? Where I don't think Frodo would be as interested in what did he look like? What was the, what exactly was his spiritual state at the time? Um, Sam, of course, is very focused on that. Um, especially since Gandalf's statement that he may become like a glass filled with a clear light for eyes to see that can seems to me deliberately to foreshadow what Sam himself perceives in Frodo later on. Um, I think that Sam adds that because he wants to set that up later on. Um, De La Mancha, I think it's only Gandalf who can see the transparency. To the wizard's eye, I think is the important phrase there, right? Gandalf can still see with his wizard's eye, right, um, things about Frodo. He can still see some... Well, what is he seeing, exactly? Is he seeing... Um, is this hangover from the wound? Or is this the result of Frodo's putting on the ring, right? Probably the first, probably the wound, right? Do we even know what hand Frodo wears the ring on when he's put it on? Does he put it on his right hand? I don't think we've ever gotten that mentioned, right? We know that he was stabbed in the left shoulder. Um, yeah. For Thoughtless, I'm not sure if we need to imagine Sam putting words into Gandalf's mouth. Again, Gandalf could have told him this. I don't. I, I, Gandalf could have told either one of them this after the fact, right? I don't have any problems with that. Um, I don't think Gandalf would have told Sam this now. I think Gandalf would have withheld this information from Sam. I don't think he and Sam have had this private conversation at this moment in, in, in the narrative, right? But would Gandalf tell Sam this afterwards? I can imagine that. Um... Because here's the other thing. After the field of Cormallon, after the destruction of the ring, Sam is not going to stop being concerned about Frodo. Right? He's still going to be thinking about Frodo's recovery from his ordeal. Right? So I can very easily imagine Sam continuing to pump Gandalf for information uh, and, like, compare and contrast how is he now compared to how he was in Rivendell when he was recovering. So I absolutely have no problem. Um, it's In some ways, it's even easier for me to imagine Sam having this conversation with Gandalf in Minas Tirith later, right, than Frodo having it. I mean, again, I can imagine uh, Gandalf initiating it, perhaps. 
but not Frodo. I can imagine Sam initiating this conversation very easily. Um, yeah, let's see. Um, okay, good. Trifle, we do get that Frodo puts it on his left forefinger at Weathertop. Yes, great, great. Um, he is going to put it on his right hand. We know it's going to be his right hand that's going to be maimed, right? So he will put it on there. Um, yeah, no, Sam, exactly. The shining through somehow passage is, of course, exactly the one I was talking about. Uh, the passage that I think that this passage is foreshadowing, right? Uh, pretty directly. Um, a glass filled with a clear light for eyes to see that can... Sam's eyes will be some of the eyes that can see that, right? He will perceive it. Um, uh, uh, where is that passage? Not here. <laughs> so I'm not going to worry about it too much right now. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's in the Two Towers, isn't it? Pretty sure it's in. It's a Book Four passage. Um, is it in Return of the King? It's a. It, it's a Book Six. Well, anyway. It's in Athelion. I thought it was in Athelion. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and of course, Scudo, you're absolutely right. A glass filled with clear light is a description of the file of Galadriel. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yep. Yep. No, I'm pretty sure it's, uh, it's in Athelion. Yeah. Um, Yeah, Brandon says that he always found this to be an effective part of the book. It's the first time we've heard an expert on wraithification slash ring fading assess someone who they knew before the process started. Uh, it's helpful to establish what the beginnings of fading look like. Um, that there is still something of transparency um, about his left hand, right? is clearly a, a memory of the way, like the, the way that he was being drawn into the Wraith world. Right. Um, I mean, it introduces this almost uh, physical metaphor, right. Of, uh, as if almost as if Frodo was being dr drawn into the Wraith world by the arm, right. Um, the arm that was infected, the arm that was dead, where he was stabbed. Um, but also again, the hand that we, no, and uh, uh, trifle. Um, I had forgotten that detail. If we, if he puts it on his left forefinger, um, that makes sense. Uh, that you know that we actually he had the ring on his left hand as well. Um, I do think, I do think that it's a combination of those two things. Um, yeah. Mad Violinist, uh, so uh, Rinrus says, does that line demonstrate that Gandalf foresees Frodo's full journey? Yes. I think yes. When Gandalf says, says he is not half through yet, and to what he will come in the end, not even Elrond can foretell. Right? Um, he is not half through yet. Gandalf said way back in the parlor at Bag End, right? It may be your task to seek the fiery mountain or that task may be for others. But I think already at that point, Gandalf had a shrewd idea that it was indeed going to be Frodo's task. Um, whether he's just trying to break it to Frodo gently and doesn't want to lay that on him right then. So it could be that he's downplaying it just out of tact. Right. Um, but it is also possible that he's not yet sure, but now he's sure. Right. Rococo go back to the one day at a time thing. Right. Um, I, uh, myself, uh, Myself, I think that um, Gandalf 
sees clearly now. So he knows in Bag End that Frodo needs to bear the ring to Rivendell. I would imagine seeing what Frodo has come through still bearing the ring, right? Um, not just meaning, look at all the dangers that he has overcome, because again, like when you really look at it, he has done many absurd things. Remember the, what we were talking about in Bree and um, Strider's initial <laughs> poor opinion, right, of these hobbits. Like, they're so incompetent, this must be a trap, right? Um, but, um, but it's not just that, right? Clearly what, Gan- what matters most to Gandalf is look at how he has resisted, right? Look at him, even with the blade in his body, look how he resisted, right? Look, uh, despite the temptation and even putting on the ring on several occasions, yet nevertheless, right, his will, despite putting on the ring and the, you know, despite giving in, despite heading down that road and starting down the slippery slope of, of ring ownership, right, he still had the strength to resist that splinter of that blade and the wraithification process for that long, right? For 17 days. Um, I think now Gandalf is pretty sure, right? Okay. Uh, Frodo has auditioned successfully for the job. Uh, I think that Gandalf is already pretty clear that uh, this is going to be Frodo's job. Uh, At least very, very suspicious. Now, let me uh, come back for a second because there was some confusion. Harneth, no, we had talked about this before. It is He is going to wear the ring on his right hand. It's the finger from his right hand that Gollum is going to bite off. No question. Um, but he puts the ring on his left hand at Weathertop. Now, if we think about the mechanics of this, this actually makes a, a good deal of sense to me, right? Pre-Rivendell, he is carrying the ring in his pocket. Um, so in his right pocket, I believe, right? So he's going to pull out the ring out of his right pocket and put it on his left hand. That makes perfect sense if you're holding the ring in your right hand pocket, right? Um, when he puts on the ring later on, it's on a chain around his neck, right? So he then can just take it and put his right finger right into it, right? Uh, from the chain around his neck. Um, so... The po- the pocket is seems to me what makes the difference there. Uh, was he wearing it on his left hand every single time he's worn the ring prior to this point? We don't really know that for sure, um, but that seems to me very possible. But um, but yeah, no question. At Mount Doom, he's wearing the ring on his right hand. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, Good. Okay, let's see. Um, and I agree, Trifle, there is some really interesting symbolism about that, right? I don't know that I would want to go super far all the way with that, because we don't know. I mean, I suspect he's wearing the ring on his right hand in Bree, in the Prancing Pony, right? Because there, the ring slips onto his finger when he has his hand in his pocket. So I'm pretty sure it's the right hand accidentally, right? Uh, that he has it on there. Um, uh, yeah, Mad Violinist was just saying the same thing. Exactly. Um, but, um, yeah. Anyway, um, I think... So I wouldn't want to... If, if we had really clear information... That it was like left hand only before and right hand. Uh, I would be tempted to say, placing the ring on his right hand, that that's a thing that you do when you're claiming the ring, right? Whereas the left hand was just using the ring uh, as an expedient. That to me is kind of a tempting interpretation there, but I don't think we've got enough evidence to really be sure about that. Um, yeah. Uh We'll see. Uh, we'll see uh, if we get any. I'll be interested to see any other references. I don't recall, but I didn't recall the one at Weathertop either. So, um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm not um, a couple of people talking about like wedding ring traditions in different places and stuff. 
to me, I, I'm not sure I, uh, uh, I'm not sure I really make that connection necessarily. I, to me, I'm just looking at the internal change, right? Um, because certainly the last time, and there's no question that the last time Frodo puts on the ring, right? When he's wearing it and Gollum bites it off his hand, he has claimed it, right? Frodo is put on the ring and he does not mean to take it off ever again, right? When he puts it on uh, in The Return of the King, right? At the crack of doom. Um, does he put it on in a different way, right? Um, in a different place, on a different finger, on a different hand, right? I, it would be interesting. Let me say, if I were doing a screen adaptation of this, I think I would do that. I think I would show a difference between where and how he puts it on when he claims it for his own uh, and where and how he puts it on when he's just using it, right? Um, but uh, anyway. Okay. Um Look at the rest of the things that he's diagnosing, though. We went right to the hand transparency, which is understandably we went right to the hand transparency, but there's more. The color had come back to his face, and his eyes were clear and fully awake and aware. He was smiling, and there seemed to be little wrong with him. Um, one thing that we get here is, here's what just anybody can see. And here's what he can only see with his wizard's eye, right? The faint change, the transparency, as it, a hint, as it were, of transparency, right? It's very, very faint, right? Very, uh, very subtle. Um, but the stuff that you can see that anybody could see um, seems to me important, too. The color had come back to his face. That speaks to his physical recovery, but of course I can't help but um, think of it in terms of like wraithification as well, right? He is no longer pale. He is no longer, uh, you know, it looks like he is returned to himself. Um, I, I don't think it's merely like his his own rude physical health that's being alluded. I think it is that as well, but I think there's more to it than that because of where, where it transitions after that. His eyes were clear and fully awake and aware. Frodo is driving the bus, right? He is in charge. He is no longer suffering something. He is no longer the victim of a different will victim of an outside force. That's what he has been, right? Um, Gandalf is seeing that is not the case. Gandalf is confirming, because apart from, you know, they, they melted the splinter, right? The power of the wound was broken. They know that. And yet, they haven't actually seen this. You know, he's assessing what's the impact on Frodo, right? Um what are going to what are going to be the long term effects of this? Um, his eyes were clear and fully awake and aware. I kind of think about the uh, the opposite of that. Like, what was he concerned that he might see? If his eyes were not clear. Um, if his eyes were still kind of dull and stupefied, right? I, I think, right? Again, the opposite of fully awake and aware. He sees like Frodo behind his eyes, right? He sees that Frodo's mind and will are alive and active. Um, and that seems to be, that's the thing that he's looking for. And he, Frodo, is smiling. Right? There seemed to be little wrong with him. Um, I, I, I Clearly, I think. I think it's pretty clear he is not primarily interested in Frodo's physical well-being here. It's his spiritual well-being. What is the state of his will? Um, Rococo points out, is this the first time there's been an opportunity to diagnose someone brought back from the brink of wraithification? 
if, you know, maybe not the first time that, you know, we've seen, we know there are examples of other people experiencing Morgul wounds, uh, right in other contexts. Uh, probably someone has recovered in the past. Um, but, um, uh, but still, I mean, has there been a case just like this? No. I mean, the ring makes this a unique case in any circumstances, right? Um, because even if there have been other ex- ex- experiences with people on the path to wraithification from other situations, right? Especially from other Morgul wounds, um, they weren't carrying the one ring at the time, right? So, uh, again, the the very significant thing is that Frodo's will has been under assault from two fronts simultaneously out from the witch king but also from the ring itself and we saw both of those things separate things in action against frodo um yeah yeah um tony asks if we can uh, assume that he was the opposite of all this when he arrived yeah i would think so um when we were like that, that grayness, right. That was coming between him and his friends. That's what it looked like from Frodo's point of view. I sus I suspect from the outside point of view, somebody else looking into his eyes, Tony, yes, it would have looked like that, that his eyes would have been dull and not awake, not aware. Right. Um, yeah, that seems to me perfectly, perfectly fair. Um, yeah. Okay, let's see. Um, Tawath says, I, I, I always hear a giant butt in this passage um, because Frodo still has the ring and the ring is still working. Um, well, we get the butt, right, with the wizard's eye, right? Externally, he seems fine. Um, and I don't just mean externally in the sense of physically. Look into his eyes, right? A, a, the, a superficial diagnosis of his spiritual mental uh you know an emotional state also looks good right but there's a change um that i think is a really important word the transparency the hint of transparency about his left hand it's not just a lingering effect like it's not just this is not the spiritual equivalent of well, your bone is healed, but it's still kind of twinge in bad weather, right? Um, you know, like, like it's like, like it's, or you know, it still might ache for a while, but then it'll, it'll stop aching after a while. Like that's not the case, right? It's, it's changed. There is a change in him, not just he's not a hundred percent better yet, but he's changed. He's different now. Um, he has been altered by this experience and it's that alteration that um, it's that alteration that Gandalf can perceive. That's what he's seeing when he's seeing the hint of transparency around his left hand. Frodo's left hand is not getting better. It's that's, that's it. Right. I think that what he's seeing, uh, we know that Frodo is going to have a residual physical and spiritual uh, struggle from this wound, right? Even later on, right? A year from now, he's going to be like, oh, the wound is aching, right? But it's not just the physical wound. It's also his spirit, right? Is also still going to be residually wounded. That, I think, is what Gandalf is seeing. Um, that transparency, hint of transparency in his hand is an indicator, like, there is a, there's still a kind of a spiritual imprint on his person, Right, because of this wound, it's going to make his wound ache uh, and his heart sick. Right, um, next to October, um, uh, it's still marked him. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, Exactly, Jacques. It's transparent to Gandalf's eyes because that's the location of the spiritual wound that's left the mark. Absolutely. That's it. Um, And I think it's... I don't think it's necessarily 
the power of the ring that he's looking at. I think when Gandalf is assessing Frodo here, one of the things that he's doing is assessing um, his prospects, right? He's looking at Frodo in two ways here. One, as a friend, right? Is Frodo okay? Is it safe to go on and tell him? But he is also looking at Remember, he just sort of showed himself as the, a leader of the opposition of Sauron, right? We already, we just got a hint of that. And now he's looking at Frodo not only as a friend, not only as a sort of physician, right? But also as a captain. Is he too damaged to go on? He has shown himself to be an excellent ring bearer candidate. Uh, he is... I think clearly Gandalf's nominee, right, for ring bearer now on. Frodo, we should send Frodo to Mount Doom. The ring has to go to Mount Doom. Someone has to carry it. I think it should be Frodo. I absolutely think that Gandalf is thinking that here. And so when he's assessing Frodo, one of the things that he seems to be assessing is, is he too compromised by this wound, right? Is he going to be too weakened so that he can't resist the ring? The narrative that he does with himself um, seems to me to, that's what seems to me to suggest that, right? That must be expected. He is not half through yet, and to what he will come in the end, not even Elrond can foretell. Not to evil, I think. He knows that Frodo is going to be changed more, right? That's what is in store for Frodo. One way or another, Frodo is going to be continue. Is going to be it's going to be more than a hint of transparency at the end, right? What's going to happen to him? How is this going to pan out? Jacques, I think when he says he's not half through yet, I don't think he means halfway through his healing. I do think he means halfway through his quest. Absolutely. Um, and he so when he's saying when he's wondering about what he will come to, what Frodo will come to, I think that we can see that in a couple different ways. And I think they're simultaneous. I don't think that these things are in conflict with each other. I think he's thinking, can he do it? Can he pull it off? Right? Um, yeah. Yeah. Not to evil, I think. I don't think it's going to overwhelm him. Also, I think he's also ass assessing him as a friend and as a caregiver, right? Um, is he going to be okay? Is this going to destroy Frodo? No, I don't think he's going to come to evil. I don't think he's going to give in. I don't think he's going to be overcome by the other half, right? Uh, what is still ahead of him in his task. He may become like a glass filled with clear light for eyes to see that can is such a fascinating, um, such a fascinating thing for him to say, right? Um, First, it obviously connects back to the observation he has just made with his wizard's eye, right? He sees a hint of transparency and concludes that transparency will grow. What will be the outcome? Not destruction. He is not going to fade. He's not going to be destroyed or defeated. He's going to become... Galadriel's file. Yes. Yes. He may become completely transparent. But if he becomes transparent, it will be transparent in order to have a clear light shining through him. We have two models for this. One which we don't have yet, which is the file of Galadriel, 
right? Because I agree with several of you have pointed this out. This sounds exactly like a description of the file of Galadriel, right? Um, but the other thing, of course, is Glorfindel, Aragorn, exactly. Yes, we have seen we have seen a white light shining through the form and raiment of Glorfindel as well, right? Um, that kind of power, that blessed realm presence about uh, about him when what has already happened to Frodo has begun to make him in some spiritual sense perceptible by Gandalf's eye transparent what's going to happen if that process continues if the transparency process goes on indefinitely what will occur and the answer is not withering it's not destruction he will become a transmitter of light right clear light will shine through if he becomes transparent light will shine through him and tony i agree i think we have to think of the light of valinor what other light do we have right we especially remember this is the same conversation it's only like two paragraphs ago that Gandalf was describing the white light of Gorfindel, right? That when, you know, when, when um, Frodo had just said, you know, I saw a white shining figure. Was that Gorfindel then? Yep. Uh-huh. It was. Um, yeah, we will see Frodo unveiled, uncloaked, uh, Frumius. I agree. Um, What, he, what I think he sees or what he projects, what he believes, what he trusts is going to happen, is that Frodo will be a vessel. Frodo will be an instrument of the light, and the light will shine through him. Should the transparency continue, it will be okay. What will that mean for Frodo? Right? I mean, he will still be wounded. He will still be scarred by this, just as the transparency in his hand is a remnant of that wound, right? Is a result of that wound. It's not a happy thing, right? Um, this is not transparency in the sense of purification, right? As if Frodo is being polished and transformed into something radiant and, and excellent. No, the transparency is a result of suffering, right? It is the transparency... It is a reduction of Frodo's hmm, self. I don't know if that's quite the right way to say it. But I think back to um, Bilbo and his butter scraped over too much bread, right? Um, that sense that we get from the from the start, right? From the start of the book when we're talking about the ring and these kinds of wraithification and spiritual matters, like mortals have this finite and comparatively small quantity of life, right? Uh, and to, for a mortal to stretch that out is to spread it thinner and thinner, like butter on toast, of course, in Bilbo's delightfully hobbit phrase. Frodo's life is going to be drained out, right? It's going to be burned out, sacrificed. Um, if he becomes transparent, if he becomes like a glass in the way that his hand is already partially transparent because he has been, part of him is still like gone, right? Is still wraithification, um, still wraithified. This is, again, this is, clumsy i think i think that this is still um not quite uh i think this is not quite articulating it exactly right yet but i think we're kind of moving in the right general direction gandalf is clearly acknowledging he knows what frodo is going to go through and maybe not exactly and you know all of the details but i believe in this sentence to himself he is acknowledging Frodo's suffering. But he does not believe 
that Frodo is going to come to evil, right? That it's not, he's not dooming Frodo to destruction. Um, but he is going to permit, to go along with, to even encourage Frodo to perform the act of sacrifice that he's going to be performing by taking on this quest, by being the ring bearer. Gandalf knows what it's going to cost him. But Gandalf also knows that in doing so, should he do so, right? Should he empty, pour out himself? Yes, I like that. Um, I think that's a very apt way uh, to say it. Who was talking about? Um, oh, yeah, Bruce, right? Yes. Should he pour out his life for many? Um you know, just to, 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 to coin a phrase there, Bruce, right? Um, well, no, let's not be coy, uh, or indirect. Uh, Bruce is, is recalling the, the, the Eucharistic ritual. Um, this is the blood, uh, uh, poured out for many, right? Um, if Frodo does undertake that Christ-like sacrifice, the result is not going to be, uh, uh, n negation, right? The result is not going to be destruction. Um, it's going to be light will shine through him, right? Um, yeah, yeah. Um, there is going to be Tony. I agree, an act of an act of grace. And Matt, I do. I think it's interesting to think of it as a kind of an alchemical transformation. Um, yeah. There will be both reduction and purification involved, but but uh, but again, also he's also going to get burned up, right? Um, you know, he can't. Uh, he's not going to recover from that um, in this world, right? He can only go to Valinor in that wonderful way that we were looking at a couple weeks back. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, in this context, it is interesting, Matt, that he's deferring to Elrond's ability to foresee the future. Um, and I agree with you, Matt, that it does imply that Elrond, he and Elrond have already discussed this. Um, yes. And so I agree when we see Elrond's response to Frodo's volunteering at the end of the council we should keep this in mind that he and Gandalf have apparently talked about this, right? Um, not even Elrond can foretell to what he will come in the end. Not even Elrond can foretell. Um, it is an interesting piece of trivia at the least that foretelling the ends of things is a, like an Elrond thing, Right. At the very least, we I think it we can conclude that Elrond in general is 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 in general pretty good at that, right? Um, but uh, but obviously there's there's more to it than that. Um, I would also point out Gandalf. We we shouldn't overlook that Gandalf is saying he may become like a glass filled with a clear light, right? That may be what occurs. Um, but I don't think that's Gandalf just being tentative. Um, I don't think that that's Gandalf saying, maybe this will happen, or maybe it'll be really bad, right? No, he say, he, when he starts with saying, not to evil, I think, right? It is my opinion that he is not going to come to evil, that he's not going to be morally destroyed. He might die, but he's not going to come to, he's not going to come to evil. There's a difference, right? Um, he may become like a glass filled with a clear light for eyes to see that can. I think the way that I would paraphrase that is Gandalf saying, this is the worst case scenario, right? In the worst case, if maybe he'll pull through, maybe it'll be okay, right? Maybe it won't be so bad, but what's going to be the outcome? I don't think he's going to come to evil. I don't think that he is going to succumb. I don't think he's going to fail. Um, so what's the worst that could happen? He may become like a glass 
He may become completely transparent. He may lose, he may pour out all of himself. But if he does, he'll still be feel, filled with a clear light. Or, not even still, he will become filled with a clear light. That clear light will only be the more visible, the more transparent he becomes. Um, because this, notice the transition from here, you look splendid, he said aloud, right? Um, Gandalf chooses to move forward, not just to move forward with telling him the story, but to move forward with everything, with a quest, right? With having Frodo be the ring bearer. Um, uh, yeah. Um, this, that seems to be the final point that Gandalf is bringing himself around to, right? Now, somebody, and I forget uh, who it was because it was a long time ago, one of you was saying it's kind of interesting that Gandalf is actually kind of wrong about this, right? Frodo does come to evil, briefly, right? Had not Gollum been, he would have finished coming to evil, right? Um, if Gandalf, if when Gandalf says not to evil, I think... Um, if by that he means, I don't think he's going to succumb to the power of the ring. I don't think he's going to become either a mini ra ring lord or a wraith by the end. I think the worst case scenario is he becomes like a glass filled with a queer light for eyes to see that can. Um, he's not necessarily, I mean, he turns out to kind of be right, but only barely, right? Um I think that's fair. I think that's fair. Um, uh, it's hard, right? Because on the one hand, you can easily make an argument saying that Gandalf is wrong. He does come to evil. Frodo does fail. Um, the quest succeeds, but it's not Frodo's fault that it succeeds, right? Um, it would have failed had Gollum not been there. Um, but I... But the thing is, when you form... Trying to... Even the, like saying the sentences that I was just saying, right? Formulating those sentences. You can't say that he... Because he doesn't fail, right? Frodo doesn't end up coming to evil. You know, I keep saying, like, well, if, it, if we're not for Gollum, then... But it was for Gollum, right? Gollum was there. Um, Frodo is not, in fact, allowed to come to evil. So Gandalf's not wrong, actually. Right? At the end of the day, Gandalf's right. Right? Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, you're right, Tony. But uh, thinking about Frodo's actions at the crack of at the cracks of doom um, is enough for another decade. Absolutely. Um, yep. Yeah. No. Exactly. Providence is is very much active. Bricktails, and we can see that. And again, I think the light. Yeah, I, I have to think that, and I agree with. Um, uh, and again, sorry, I forget who it was a little while back who was saying that the. You know, the, the light shining through isn't just light from the blessed realm, but, but Iluvatar's light as well. I don't see any clear textual evidence for that, but I still agree with you uh, in this sense that, like, when we see, like, whose light is it, right? What's really going on? This is not just intervention of the Valar. This is not just Elbereth coming in in support of the E-bomb, right? This is, um, this is Providence itself. Why does Frodo not fail? What keeps Frodo from coming to evil? Providence does, right? Um, and so, yes, yes, um, there is another power at work there, right? Uh, you were meant to find the ring and not by its maker. Um, I believe that that power is the power whose light that we're seeing there as well. And of course, to say, is it the light of Iluvatar, the light of the blessed realm is, in my opinion, not much of a choice, right? Like, why does, why is there light in the blessed realm, right? Um, even that, of course, is reflected light from Iluvatar itself. So, uh, 
you know, it's uh, not much to choose, I think, between the two of them. Um, but, uh, yeah, yeah. Anyway, um... Looking at the time, and we have a long slide. Well, let's give it a shot. Yeah, the flame imperishable. We do have that. Um, and Tony, especially if you think about... the kind of uh, hierarchy, right? The flame imperishable which is with Iluvatar, the Silmarils, and the light of the Silmarils, encased in imperishable crystal, um, which is like an echo of the flame imperishable that is set at the center of Arda by Iluvatar, right? Um, we think about the file of Galadriel, right? Which contains, like, reflected light of the Silmaril, Um and Frodo here being compared himself like a living Silmaril, like a living file um, in which that light is. I, I think that we can see sort of the echoes of that all the way back, Tony, to the flame imperishable. In the end, yeah, it's all light. All of it is reflected, is, you know, the, sp the splintered light uh, from the flame imperishable anyway, right? Um. Anyway, okay. Um, you look splendid, he said aloud. I will risk a brief tale without consulting Elrond. But quite brief, mind you, and then you must sleep again. This is what happened as far as I can gather. Hang on a second, let's pause before we start there. You look splendid. Let's just start with... You, you look splendid. Um... That's a really interesting thing to say. I mean, on the one hand, this is Gandalf being cheerful again, right? And building up Frodo's spirits. And also, it's not a lie. He does look splendid, right? Again, the exteriors are all, like, all indicators are good, right? It's just that little hint of transparency that only his wizard's eye can see, right? The, the, the looking into the sort of spiritual side, right? He can see this wound, the remnants of this wound. Um, and so, sure, all things considered, he looks splendid. But, but I think there's much more to it than that, right? Splendor is exactly what Gandalf is foreseeing in Frodo's future, right? To be, to be like a clear glass with light shining through it, that is splendor indeed, right? That is what, what it means to look splendid. Exactly, it refers to shining in light, yes. So when he says to Frodo, you look splendid, that is both a piece of slightly exaggerated uh, uh, boosting of Frodo's confidence, but it's also a foretelling of what he has just seen, right? Um, he, 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 he looks, he is splendid in waiting, right? There is splendor in his future. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, I can't think that that word choice is an accident. I mean, it works perfectly fine as a conversational piece. You look splendid, right? It is a kind of thing that you would say in a bolstering fashion, right, by somebody's sickbed. Um, but in the context of what Gandalf was just thinking, clearly it suggests more than that. Um, anyway, okay. Yeah, Jacques, it is cool how Gandalf finds a way to voice his thoughts in a way that's appropriate for the present moment, right? Um, yeah, yeah. Okay, by the way, after discussing that passage, I feel even more strongly that it's Sam who wrote that, right? Because I think that Sam, Sam wants this, 
<laughs> Sam wants to make sure we get the the clear glass with the shining light that is Frodo into the text, right? Um, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. Um, yep, yep. Um, yeah. Anyway, okay. Sorry. This is what I happened as far as I can gather. The riders made straight for you as soon as you fled. They did not need the guidance of their horses any longer. You had become visible to them, being already on the threshold of their world. And also, the ring drew them. Your friends sprang aside off the road or they would have been ridden down. They knew that nothing could save you if the white horse could not. The riders were too swift to overtake, and too many to oppose. On foot, even Glorfindel and Aragorn together could not withstand all the nine at once. When the ringwraith swept by, your friends ran up behind. Close to the ford, there is a small hollow beside the road, masked by a few stunted trees. There they hastily kindled fire, for Glorfindel knew that a flood would come down if the riders tried to cross, and then he would have to deal with any that were left on his side of the river. The moment the flood appeared, he rushed out, followed by Aragorn and the others with flaming brands. Caught between fire and water, and seeing an elf lord revealed in his wrath, they were dismayed, and their horses were stricken with madness. Three were carried away by the first assault of the flood, the others were now hurled into the water by their horses and overwhelmed. Okay. Um, okay. First on the riders and resisting the riders. One thing that he emphasizes is their complete focus on him, right? Um, your friends sprang aside because they would have been ridden out like that. The riders were going to ride right over them. Remember that line from Sam, right? When Sam comes out, when they meet, when they're uh, riding with farmer maggot in his pony trap and they meet, Mary in the fog and they don't know who they just hear the hooves right uh though as we pointed out you can tell from the sound of the hooves that it's obviously not a black rider's horse right um but um but um he in that moment Sam the narrator says of Sam that the black riders would have to ride over him to get to the cart, right? Where Frodo is being concealed. Um, they would have ridden right over him to get to Frodo here. Right. Um, uh, which is kind of, uh, which is kind of fun. Uh, so. Yeah, there are several things to talk about. They knew nothing could save you if the white horse could not. They knew that the only option was to run. Fighting the riders was a non-option. The riders were too many to oppose. Glorfindel and Aragorn together couldn't withstand all the nine at once. Now Tiber says, didn't Glorfindel take on five of the nine all by himself earlier? Yes, but... First, they're all nine together, and that's more than an arithmetic change. That's one thing that seems clear. We don't know exactly how or why, but when when you have the whole set, when all nine of the riders are together, it's different. They are more than nine times as strong as each one of them alone when they're together. That's a pattern that we're uh, um, that ha has been suggested more than once, right? Um, I, we can even hear that I think behind Aragorn's statement why they were not all here, right? After the attack on on Weathertop, um, yeah. So they're definitely greater than their greater than their sum when they're all together. So that's one thing. Um, you could say, well, but now it's Gorfindel plus Aragorn, right? Not to mention plus. The other three hobbits, who also were a factor in the Dell under Weathertop. But the other thing that they mention is on foot. 
Glorfindel, when he took on the five at once, single-handedly, was also mounted. He was on his horse at that point. On the one hand, that would seem to be a strangely, uh, a strangely mundane tactical thing to say, right? Um, like seriously, because cavalry have an advantage over infantry, uh, like that's why they're not going to, because they don't have horses. If they had horses, Right, so if Glorfindel and Aragorn were both mounted, well, then okay, Aragorn and Glorfindel mounted against the nine. Um, <laughs> Fourth Thoughtless says maybe the bells weren't just bling after all. Uh, it may, maybe, maybe. Um, and I agree, Belongs Mount Asphaloth is not just any horse. Tiber says, what if Aragorn had a complete sword? Exactly, Tony. What if Aragorn had a primary weapon that worked? Um, I'm not sure. I really am not sure what's behind that statement, the on foot. Because in general, I'm pretty convinced that when you're fighting Nazgul, it's not about traditional battle tactics, right? It's not about um, flanking your enemy in Weathertop. It's not about uh, infantry being at a disadvantage in fighting against cavalry. Um, Zephan says, would horses elevate their spiritual prowess? Yeah, I kind of think it would, right? Picture it. Picture it. You're standing on foot. Your enemy is in front of you on horseback. What's the situation? You're standing there looking up at him, right? Um, he is in your enemy there, right? The rich king is in a position of authority over him, right? It's got to impact your morale, right? I, I, I kind of think, uh, um, I kind of think it does. I kind of think it would make a difference, don't you think? Um, I don't know. I mean. That might not seem like enough by itself, and I don't, uh, uh, I'm not trying to put too much on that, but, uh, um, here's the thing that we have to counterbalance this with. On foot, even Gorfindel and Aragorn together could not withstand all the nine at once. No, they couldn't withstand them, meaning they couldn't hold them back. To withstand the Nine would have been to come between Frodo and them and hold them off so that Frodo could escape, right? Um, that's what withstanding all the Nine at once would have looked like. It is obviously untrue that Glorfindel and Aragorn on foot cannot oppose the nine they can oppose the nine right they do oppose the nine um together all five of them right one elf lord uh one ranger and three hobbits do attack right from behind with torches right um and that has an effect Right, that does have a positive impact. Um, yeah, Matt says I wouldn't want to fight a spiritual battle while simultaneously trying not to be ridden down and protect the three hobbits. Um, again, they're certainly at a disadvantage, and again, it's not a merely tactical advantage. Again, as if like because they don't fight hand to hand with the ring rates, right? Um, nobody. Nobody is ever going to fight hand-to-hand with a ringwraith until Eowyn. 
Eowyn is going to be the first person to fight hand-to-hand -hand with the Ringwraith, and even then... I'll have some things to say about that even then, right? Um, so, anyway. Again, it's not about... That's why I say it's not about battle tactics. It's not like, well, their sh sword strokes coming from up above are going to be much... They're not exchanging sword strokes. That's not how you withstand the Nine, right? Um, but as long as they're on horseback and galloping towards you and you're on foot, what are you going to... You can't stop them, right? Um, yeah. Frodo kind of does on Weathertop? Kind of. Kind of. Um... Yeah, JJ says when the nine are galloping, they can't hear Aragorn's songs. True enough. True enough. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Matt, I, 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 I agree. I, Frodo's kind of melee combat with the Witch King, I think, serves to demonstrate my point rather than contradict it. It's not about his attack, right? His sword is not super effective. Although his sword does seem to intimidate the ring rates, it's not, uh, it's not about the sword. It's about his will to oppose them, as uh, Gandalf emphasizes, right? Because he resisted. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, he... The drawing his sword and the attempt to stab the Witch King, It's again, it's not about... Uh, the battle exchange. It's about the one will against another. Yes, Frodo uses sword attack. It is not very effective. No, but Frodo uses indomitable will. It's super effective, right? Absolutely. Um, yep. Yeah, the Witch King is obviously a ghost type. Um... Yeah, <laughs> Frodo uses Elbereth. It's super effective. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Matthias would be so proud of me that I'm getting these jokes, you guys. Um, okay. And for those of you who don't, we're making Pokemon. This is Pokemon humor, by the way. <laughs> right? A wild witch king appears. Um, yes. Yes. Anyway. Um, <laughs> Psychic is effective against ghost types. Don't even get me started on Pokemon types, man. Let's not even go there. That's a conversation for another time. Um, <laughs> anyway. <laughs> uh, simultaneously, one of my least and most favorite things about Pokemon. Um, anyhow. Uh, sounds sounds like another stream idea, Druid's Fire. Well, it's, it sounds like my son's future uh, uh, regional moot talk is what it sounds like. Um, but uh, anyway, yeah. Yeah, that's going to happen. Any, anyhow, um, <laughs> Seven approves of the turn this discussion has taken. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, Matthias is already planning. Like, he, you know, having witnessed a moot, he came with me to Sunshine Moot in Orlando, and he's like... Yeah, next mood. He's given a talk. No more passive observing of moods for him. Um, but uh, yeah, it'll be good. Anyway, back to the passage. The friends run up behind. First of all, let me step back from this a second. Notice that Gandalf's story here is a story about the friends, right? He does not tell Frodo, here's what really happened with the Ringwraiths, right? He does not tell Frodo, let me tell you the real significance of that confrontation that you had with the Witch King at the Ford. Let me tell you what was really behind that. Let me tell you what was at stake or what was the... He doesn't lay out for Frodo the spiritual realities of his conflict with the, with the Ringwraiths. Um... The Ringwraiths, this is not a Ringwraith story. This is a uh, what your friends did story, right? Um, uh, and so that's, I, I, I think, an interesting thing. Um, 
uh, and I think an important point. Not only because, of course, this is a, what Frodo wanted to know from the beginning. Is everybody okay? He doesn't only, that is, Gandalf doesn't only just say, yeah, they're okay, but they were awesome, right? Um, they actually were a big part of the victory at the fort, right? So that's cool and good of Gandalf, to, like shrewd of Gandalf as well, right? Let's build up Frodo's spirits again and, uh, and help him... Uh, uh, help him uh, take heart right at the situation um but um uh, but i think it's also interesting what we l- i i i think he also wants frodo to learn other things from this uh as well anyway so let's keep going at what he says the friends r- ran up close r- ran up behind So there's a small hollow beside the road, masked by a few stunted trees. There they hastily kindled fire. First of all, why do we care that it's in a hollow? And why do we care that it was masked by stunted trees? Secrecy? Protection from the wind? Maybe? I mean, it could be very practical. It was easier to light a fire in that protected place. Um, are they trying to surprise the ring rates? I mean, the ring rates seem to be all pretty focused on Frodo, so they're unlikely, I think, to look around behind them. Um, I doubt it's... The emphasis, I doubt that the purpose of the emphasis is the windscreen. Um, I mean, yeah, it would make starting a fire easier, but look, I have my doubts. They hastily kindled fire. How? How? Flint and Tinder? They better have done that pretty darn fast. Look, um, I would like to include this in our reenactment of the flight to the fort, right? I still hope to do a reenactment of the flight to the fort at Mythmoot this year. This is one of the things that... So the angles that the ring rates take is one of the things that I'm going to be interested to sort out, right? Like the movements of the ring rates from the initial setup to standing in the ford, right? But the pursuit by the friends and the kindling of fire is another thing that I'm kind of curious about because I have my doubts about this. I really do. Because it's not just... I, I'm willing to believe, Dime, I totally buy the fact that you can, you can ignite flint and tinder very quickly if you know what you're doing. And surely Aragorn is as good at that as anyone, right? But they don't just kindle a fire with flint and tinder, right? They light brands. They carry fire. Not candles or something like that, right? Um... Flaming brands. Flaming brands they carry. They catch wood on fire. Now, this presumably is where the few stunted trees also come in. One has to think that these stunted trees uh, were sacrificed for the cause, right? It is possible that you could very quickly, within a few seconds, strike a flame in Flint and Tinder, and then if there's some relatively dry, dead brush, that could ignite pretty quickly, because they don't have to have, like, big logs on fire, right? They just have to have flames. Um, so if you have a large, dead wood, you know, dead bushes right 
again, hence the stunting that could flare up and, and right. And not too damp um, and not too expensive. Uh, you know, it would, it would flare up and, and I, I, I can just believe that it's possible, but the time frame is really, really tight, really tight, right? They have just gotten to the Ford. Frodo turns around and they have a short conversation with the, the ring rates, right? Frodo and the Witch King don't talk for a super long time, right? I, I'm kind of not thinking they're using Flint and Tinder here. I, 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 I gotta think that, um, I don't think they have time for that. Um, I think we've got some elf magic going on, Jock. That's kind of my conclusion here, but we'll see. We will, we will test it and we will see. We will probably, we, maybe we can use, Sharon was offering Flint and Tinder. We'll try it in a couple different ways, but um, we'll see. We'll see. It is certainly true. Um, uh, uh, Meleowin, Meliowin? I'm not quite sure how to pronounce your name. Um, uh, it is quite true that um, uh, pine ignites very quickly. Um, you know, having once set fire to our dead Christmas tree in the backyard, that was fairly spectacular, right? So, uh, you know, I, I, I know how that can work. But... Um, Any chance they had an accelerant? <laughs> you know, it's possible. It's possible. Um, anyway, we'll see. We'll we'll see. We'll test it. We'll test it and see and see. We'll 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 we'll, we'll time it, and we'll see what how much time we need here. Um, but uh, anyway, okay. All right. So we've got the flaming. We'll we'll we'll, we'll come back to this when we have opportunity to uh, to experiment here. Uh, Glorfindel knew that a flood would come down if the riders tried to cross. Okay, so we know that this is a thing, right? Um, this is not sudden and unexpected, and um, um, sudden and unexpected, and and uh, on you know totally unanticipated. Uh, Glorfindel knows the plan, right? There's clearly a there's clearly a um uh like a a disaster plan right at rivendell um you know they've all studied the you know the the you know in case of uh nazgul invasion release the flood right uh, everybody knows that that's well glorfindel anyway knows that that's what's going to happen uh does aragorn know that's less obvious but glorfindel certainly knows um and then he would have to deal with any that were left on this side of the river. Uh, so he's preparing himself to fight a bunch of the ringwraiths, right? Um, the moment the flood appeared, he rushed out. He is still Glorfindel. He rushed out, followed by Aragorn and the others with flaming brands caught between fire and water and seeing an elf lord revealed in his wrath they were dismayed and their horses were stricken with madness three were carried away by the first assault of the flood the others were now hurled into the water by their horses and overwhelmed oh by the way um uh remember when we were talking about asphaloth like a month two months ago um we were asking the question, which I couldn't remember off the top of my head, how much experience, firsthand experience Tolkien had with horses. Um, as I say, I've just been rereading John Garth's wonderful book, Tolkien in the Great War, um, uh, in, prepara in preparation for seeing the Tolkien movie again, the, bi the biography movie. Um, uh, and I came to the passage, which I should have remembered before. Yes, Tolkien had lots of experience uh, with horses. Um, in fact, he was so good with the horses in his uh, 
not his regiment, not the not when he enlisted for the war, but when he was doing um, uh, b- b- military stuff prior to uh, the war. Um, there's a reference to the fact that they kept like he would break in a horse, a new horse, and then they would take his horse away and give it to someone else and give him a new horse. Like he became the sort of de facto horse breaker uh, for his troop um, because he was so good at it, apparently. So um, he had a lot of experience. He knew horses pretty well uh, and, and was apparently very good with them. Um, so, uh, so, so yeah, that, that's uh, that, that was before the war broke out several years before the war broke out, but still, um, that that was part of his uh, repertoire personally. So so yes, Tolkien did have uh, lots of firsthand experience with horses. Um, okay, um, let's see. Hang on, we have another question here. Um, oh yeah, why have the hobbits been relegated to the others? Let's see. I think I think it's fairly simple. I don't think it's there's any offense here. Like I don't think that Gandalf is slighting the other hobbits. I think that Gandalf is um uh yeah. Luke says, as someone who's uh, done that, that's some impressive horsemanship uh, for an English professor. Yeah, well, Tolkien was a, a spunky fellow in his younger days. I mean, this is the guy, he was, you know, uh, one of the captains of the rugby team. I mean, he was, uh, um, he was uh, physically kind of a go-getter uh, in his younger years. Uh, he definitely was not, um, if you project backwards towards Tolkien's youth and imagine him as always the like sedentary scholarly, you know, like that was not Tolkien in his younger days. He was very, very active. Um, but, uh, anyway, um, anyhow, so, um, but back to the not naming the hobbits. First of all, it would, it would be cumbersome, right. To list the ball by name. And also, there's a kind of intimacy in not naming them, right? Like, I mean, if Gandalf were all like, and then Gorfindel and Aragorn, accompanied by Frodo and Merry and Pippin, right? That would seem a little stilted and weird, like by saying the others, like he knows what others, right? He knows, it's like his friends. <clears throat> the difference to me seems to be um, not in him kind of belittling them, but in him grouping them together, right? What... um what Glorfindel does. Glorfindel is the protagonist of this, right? Um, uh, Glorfindel is the protagonist in this. Even Aragorn is part of his, his, you know, backup is like one of his backup singers here, right? Um, there's Glorfindel with Aragorn and the others. Um, I think Aragorn gets named when the hobbits don't get named because he's already named him on foot. Even Gorfindel and Aragorn together could not withstand all the nine at once. Right. So he's already they They are the two major figures here. Right. Them two and the three hobbits. Right. And the others. So Aragorn and the others come out, pop out again with their flaming brands. Again, I think it's not about them being less important. Exactly. It's about them being collective. Right. The three of them are all acting together and doing all the same thing. Um, Yeah. Yeah. Um, Mad Violinist points out that it's consistent with what Gandalf has already said. I think well of you and of the others. Um, He has already lumped uh, Sam and Mary and Pippin together. The one that he does distinguish, you'll recall, from earlier in the conversation was Sam. Right. I have heard all about Sam. He says, right. Um, I think well of you and the others. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, belongs bond. That is well remembered, uh, and really fun to kind of project back into, to imagine ourselves back into Sam's position, right? Belongs says, this is Sam's second elves, sir moment. 
Um, yeah, yeah. Imagine thinking back to the to the elves, Sir uh, Sam, right in the Shire. Uh, he had the experience at Woodhall, right, um, where he had that encounter with the elves and the conversation with the elves and the charge that was laid upon him by the elves, right. Um, and now seeing an elf lord revealed in his wrath, an elf lord revealed in his wrath, right? Elf sir, <laughs> right? There's elf sir, and then there's elf sir, right? Um, this is, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, Belangsman, this makes me think of Sam's comment when Frodo asks him, what do you think of elves now? And he says, they seem a bit above my likes and dislikes, right? Gorfindel seems way above uh, Sam's likes and dislikes in this particular moment, right? Um, yeah, no. Oh, I like them. Yes, sir. Uh-huh. Yeah, no, no complaints for me. I'm just not going to get in the way of that. Yeah. Yeah, this would be um, a very, very memorable moment um, uh, for Sam, I think, clearly. Um, uh, Caught between fire and water. We don't know why the Ringwraiths don't love fire. Sauron can put fire to his own evil purposes, but these riders do not love it, Aragorn says. Um, it is like being caught between two purifying elements. Um, uh, Malayawin, I agree. Um, Yeah, Luke, it is amazing to imagine being the hobbits there. And actually, I think coming back again, Matt, to your point about the others, right? Like, even to get included, right, as one of the others here is kind of amazing. Um, yeah, yeah. Imagine, yeah, Luke, that is a really cool thing to think about, right? Here's Sam, uh, Mr. Elves, sir. Uh, imagine going back to the... Uh, you know, to 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 bag end right after Sam has just been infenestrated, and uh, and telling Sam right there, within what a few months, right within six months, um, within six months, Sam, you are going to be charging behind a prince of the Noldor revealed in his power uh, against the, some of the, the most terrible servants of Sauron, right? You're going to be, you're going to be flanking, uh, you know, riding at the, or, you know, uh, charging into battle uh, at the side of, of one of the Lords of the Noldor. That's yeah. Uh, uh, pretty amazing. Um, Yeah, Aragorn is pointing out that uh, remember what else fire is in Tolkien's world. It's also the flame imperishable. Yeah, yeah. We can't forget that association with fire, uh, with flame as well. Um, Sauron can put fire to his evil uses, but these riders do not love it. Just thinking back to that line again, it really does show how the domination of the enemy over anything, really, right, is artificial, right, is fake, is fraudulent, really, right? I mean, it's all a deception. It's a deceit of the enemy, as Galadriel says, right? Um, fire isn't evil, right? Yes, it's destructive, but it's not bad. It's not evil. Sauron can use it, and he can associate it, 
with evil, right? I mean, it's even part of his logo, right? I mean, the flaming eye is, I mean, there's fire associated with, uh, uh, with his very, like, iconography, right? Um, and yet, he doesn't own fire, right? That's a lie. That's fake. Um, fire is something that his servants are afraid of, right? Um, fire in its, you know, in its true form is like, it, it's those things which the enemy seeks to enslave, um, always in the end, like they, they're, they're not containable. They're not controllable. Uh, and part of the, part of the dominion, part of the enslavement is fear. Right to seek to put yourself above things, to seek to dominate them, just as it was fear that motivated him to make the one ring so that he could dominate the other lesser rings. Right, um, so even there's, it's almost like this: the fear of fire is almost like a natural result of the way in which, or like a corollary to perhaps um, the way in the, the the fact that Sauron seeks to dominate and use fire. Um, yeah, yeah, um, yeah, okay, um, it's getting real late, I should, uh, I should stop, we talked about most everything I wanted to talk about, um, Okay, there's one more thing that I should mention, but maybe we'll come back to it next time. Remind me at the beginning of class next week to talk about their horses being stricken with madness. Because we need to talk about that. We need to talk about their horses being stricken with madness. Okay, but anyway, it's late and I'm in trouble. So let us conclude our discussion of the text and we got through about two and 2.9 slides tonight perhaps so that was pretty good thanks everybody uh for joining me for our discussion i'm going to say goodbye to the folks on twitter as always and we're going to switch over for a comparatively brief field trip uh this week all right excellent okay Good evening. Good evening here. Let me just double check. Uh, Valoria, say something again? Uh, hello. No. Okay, good. Just check. making sure your audio is coming through. So it is. Good. Yeah, my, yeah my, my volume got wheeled down a bit. I hate this cord. <laughs> yeah, that's all right. Okay, cool. Um, all right. Very good. Okay, so tonight we are just about done looking around Rivendell. Uh, and Frodo's not even out of bed yet, so that's a bad sign. But um, <laughs> that's okay. Uh, so, but here we are. I'm glad, and we're going to go back to Rivendell because there's the place we haven't been. Okay, well, we haven't been to the place that you have to have rep with Rivendell to get into. So uh, yeah. we're not going to be able to do that because um, uh, Narnia has no rep. Anyway. Yeah, uh, yep. I think for Narnia, not on any server, but um, I. Anyhow, the, what we haven't seen is Arwen. We need to go see Arwen. Uh -huh. So we're going to start there tonight and then maybe head up into the mountains. We'll see if we can meet Arwen. We'll see if we can meet Arwen and Glowen tonight. But at the very least, we'll see Arwen. If it takes us a while to see Arwen, we'll just do that. Um, and we'll save Glowen for next uh, for another time. But uh, All right. we'll see. Sounds good. I'm still laughing that we managed to get Pokemon into this. <laughs> <laughs> I've been doing this with these 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 uh, talks to you online for how many years, and I never knew you knew that much about Pokemon. <laughs> I'm learning all the time. You know, I uh, I, I I have a good teacher. Um, <laughs> yeah, kids uh, get interested in something. You're going to find out whether you want to or not. Oh man, yeah, no, I, uh, um, yeah, and it's it's a lot about personality too. Um, yeah. Uh, you know, I have uh, one son who knows everything about airplanes and another son who knows everything about Pokemon. And uh, 
Uh, okay. I still don't know much about airplanes because my airplane son is uh, uh, not very talkative and he's one who internalizes his interests and, uh, you know, uh, mm-hmm. doesn't, yeah, do. doesn't feel compelled to share, you know, uh, does not yeah, derive the, the... the intrinsic pleasure out of, sh- out of sharing. Yeah, I got the one who knows everything about the Nintendo company from its uh, conception to current. And <laughs> Lord, if I can keep any of that straight. And then I got the one who's, you know, right now I'm just trying to avoid end game spoilers, and she's try- trying her hardest not to let anything lose. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. I keep saying, why don't I just go see it? No, no, you have to see Captain Marvel first. It won't count. Uh huh. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I um, am. Uh, that's actually the struggle that I'm in currently. I have not seen Endgame and will not because I've not seen Captain Marvel. And I'm really grumpy with the Disney Corporation <laughs> because they're withholding uh, Captain Marvel video, presumably until their stupid new streaming service comes online. Um, so I think I'm going to miss well, Endgame still in, in theaters. theaters. Is Cap- well, Captain, Captain Marvel, Marvel still, still in theaters. theaters? Is it? Yeah, yeah. It's only been okay. in the- it, they released it like one after the other. It was kind of crazy. Okay. Well, I'll see if I can see. Maybe I can see them both still. Uh, yeah. I don't know. Just in time for Detective Pikachu, right? <laughs> that's coming out this weekend as well. So, uh, yeah, uh, <laughs> this is a big week for movie releases in the in the Olsen family. You know, uh, yeah. the Tolkien Bob it was released, and Detective Pikachu comes out. So, yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. All right. Um, cool. All right. So I think we should mount up to go uphill here. Um, yep. No, Luke, I do. I'm sorry. I have to see Captain Marvel on because M- Captain Marvel, the character, is in Avengers Endgame, right? H- ergo, yep. I have to say, I'm sorry. I am a completionist. I can't. I can't not do. This is why I've seen no. Um, oh, hang on. This is not the way. Where do we go? I don't even remember from uh, here. We got to cross. Way, I think, yes. We got to cross. Yeah. We got to go across and then up the hill. Okay. Um, this is why I've seen no X Men movies like at all. I've seen the first two, I think, and none since then. Yeah, I've been I'm really with you on that one. Like, I, 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 I would really be interested to see Deadpool, for instance. But as soon as I discovered that <laughs> Deadpool was an X Men world movie, uh, the, no, I'm no, like, no, nope, no, that doesn't nope. count. No, no, that's a totally different Deadpool. I'm sorry, totally apocryphal. That's I the s- apocryphal Deadpool. I understand, but still, like, I can't see that movie because, like, it makes references that I don't get and I can't handle it. So, I mean, <laughs> remember, I went back and have watched all 26 seasons of the classic Doctor Who because I couldn't handle just watching the new Who and not knowing any of the uh, okay. any of the rest of it. So, which yeah, I'm almost done, by okay. the way. I am halfway through season 26. I've almost finished the classic. That Who. is impressive. Yeah. Yes, the, some of the Douglas Adam ones are one of my favorite episodes. I love that. Oh yeah, I, th- those yeah. were really well written, and I I l- absolutely love uh, uh, Sylvester McCoy. Uh, he is in my top tier of doctors. I uh, uh, I'm a huge fan of McCoy's. Um, uh, I have trouble watching Peter Davison though because he was in All Creatures Great and Small, ah. which is all that I would watch. That's the only like you know. My mom wouldn't let me watch. We were we were Star Trek only uh-huh. family. So Doctor Who was verboten. I see. Okay, sorry. I'm pausing by this guard here. So okay, so we come to this turning of the mm-hmm. ways. Um, okay. And we're gonna we, we would carry on to the right up there if we were going on to the mountains. And then mm-hmm. here's there's this one guard down here. Yes. Uh, you know which I just got the. Message: The air of M. Dolan high above Rivendell is crisp and clear. Oh, that pops up on your screen when you go up that way, does uh, it? Must be related to some quests I was doing, but okay, oh, I, see. I thought it was interesting flavor text. We don't. There's no guard down here, so it makes me wonder. I mean, I assume these are like uh, Arwen's bodyguards. Yeah. Um. Maybe. They come with her from Rivendell, or they come well, with her from Lorien. I don't think so, because we not only have a guard down here, but we saw, mm-hmm. there's that guard who's pacing up and down the path, right? Yes, doing his rounds. 
Yeah, and we haven't seen that. Like, I don't think we see... He doesn't... Does he go down here? Does he go all the way? It I think he matter. turns around at the gate. Yeah, and I'm thinking... But I'm thinking none of these people would be here if not for Arwen being up there. I mean, there's nothing to guard. Exactly. No, but at this vantage point. Oh, wait, there is this guy over here. Look at this. Where is he coming from? What is down here? There's a path here. Where does this go? Oh, I don't know. Oh, I Didn't know there was a path here. Me neither. Ah, uh, cliff. It goes to a cliff. Scenic overlook? Sort of scenic overlook. Yeah. Well, you're watching the path that goes down. It does overlook the path. Yeah, that's true. Yep. It doesn't, like, yeah, we've got this dirty great tree in the way, and it doesn't really kind of obscure as Rivendell. You can kind of see Rivendell peeking out through the trees below. It's, I uh, bet that tree grew up without them really taking notice until it was too late. And they're like, oh, now we can't move it. <laughs> <laughs> now we can't move it. Yeah, I mean, it's what? It's evening? Okay, so it's, yep. we're not going to get daylight anytime soon. Maybe we could see Rivendell better if it were daylight uh, in the game, but. Um, but, uh, anyway, um, yeah, well, sorry, I'd never, yeah, I'd never noticed this path either. That was mm -hmm. a little strange, but anyway, okay, so we've got this guard who's pacing up and down here, but again, like, are there always guards pacing around up here? Is this just part of the northern, defending the northern approaches to Rivendell? Misty or, Mountains are pretty treacherous and still has some pretty bad stuff in there, so I wouldn't possible. be surprised there's guards on this side. It's possible. I'm just trying to figure out if Arwen gets bodyguards, is my main question here. Let's see. Well, do, these get, do they even get names? No, no. no. I'm not seeing any names on them. Nope. No, they're pretty generic guards. Yep. I like the, like, gazebo of vigilance here. <laughs> I stand on my gazebo and I... It's a gazebo that actually looks like a gazebo. Yeah. Is it, does it have a statue on the top? Uh, no, it just... Uh, it's sort a little of a dome, yeah. Dome, it looks like a turtle shell. It does look like a turtle shell. Um. Hmm. Anyway, okay, because we gotta go around here. Yeah, no, I think if she had bodyguards, they would be guarding like right here. Mm hmm This path. I think they're Unless this looks like a sacred area here or something. Yeah. Um Only the lady may go up that path. This is sacred. Thoughts ground, are often sort of drawn thing. back to the woods of Lorien, the home of my mother's kindred. Okay. Have you seen my brothers? They are away in the wilderness scouting for the enemy. Yeah. Yeah, they kind of wouldn't shut up through, like, most of the troll shows. Oh, there we go. Have you seen my brother? Kept sending okay. me on menial tasks. I have but lately returned to Rivendell, my father's house. Have you seen my brothers? Okay, is that it? My thoughts are often drawn back to the woods of Lorien. Hmm. Home of my mother's kindred. Uh, let's see. So, observations about Arwen. Arwen is... Sleeveless. Scantily clad. Yeah, showing a lot of skin, Arwen is, which is a little We're surprising. high on the cold, crisp air. Well, we just mentioned that's, how cold and crisp right, it was. Right, the air is cold and crisp. Um, yeah, we do get a lot of hope here. I'm yes. at Hope 9 right now, standing oh. near Arwen. And I think uh, we, yeah, we were at, what, 5 down below? I'm 4, but I'm a gloomy elf, so I probably don't get much hope. Oh, yeah, okay. I have um, the weight of the fallen rays. So. Oh, I see. Right. Okay. I got it. Um, yeah, wanna, she's not... The sleevelessness. Yeah. I don't want to read too much into that, but have we seen the bare shoulders of any other elves? No, I was just saying the costuming involved... She. It seems to def defy most of the standards of costuming in the game. Yes. I think there are some, like, bodice... Related sleeveless dresses that are cosmetic for purchase, but none on an NPC. Yes. So it almost looks out of place. And it's interesting. And yeah, Druid's Fire is saying she's also uh, nobody else gets these ruffles. 
I mean, her dress is also very fancy. She has a very wide stance. Look how she far does. apart her feet are where she's standing. She, she looks does. like she's she having a tantrum. She's for action. Yeah, she's not. <laughs> yeah. 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 I mean, look at look at everyone else. Look at how, how we're all standing here. Yes. All flat-footed. And we could all get pushed over at a moment's notice. Arwen mm-hmm. is... Just try to push Arwen over. Um... No, thanks. Well, I mean, not too hard because you might push her off. But still, like, the point is, again, she's braced, right? Um, oh, I get it. We're here for our training with her, right? So yeah, exactly. Works. She's trying to show you how to, like, center yourself and, and, and yeah. Um, with her brothers, I'm not surprised. And what's this? Sorry, I don't want to get into the personal space of Arwen, but what's on her head? What's this? It's uh, a looks like a, it's a little lace it, cap. Yeah, it looks like a... a what we would call a Juliet cap. But right. Right. Presumably the elves have another name for it. And yeah. wow, does she have green eyes. Her eyes oh, yeah. are really green. I never <gasps> noticed that before. Like the green elf stone, like barrels. Uh-huh. Yeah, that's really great. Because that is a very similar shade to the green of the elf stone. I was, I'm just reminded because I, when I, in my Wigan marathon over the weekend, I was just at the beginning spending some time, uh, appreciating Aragorn's ornaments, right? Because of course he's wearing them all, uh, right okay. after the battle of Pelargir, he's wearing the elf stone on his breast. He's wearing the Elendil on his forehead. Uh, and he's got the, the scabbard, right? And Anduro. Uh-huh. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, I don't think we get any reference to her eyes. I mean, we get so little about Arwen in the book. We get so little about anyone. Why is Arwen special? <laughs> that's true. I mean, as far as physical description, that's true. But yeah, I'd, I the Elfstone, I, you're right. It's got to be a, an Elfstone connection. That's, um, that's really brilliant. If they did that on purpose, huge kudos uh, for the green eyes there. Um, now, Trifle says we're told that she has gray eyes and dark hair. So does everyone. So I'm not surprised yeah. they took some liberties there and good for them. Yeah, and I like it. I like the green eyes. Yeah, I, I think it adds some personality. Well, and, and the connection with the Elfstone is really, you know, of course, it makes me think of Aragorn saying, or Bilbo rather saying, you know, he insisted I add a green stone. Um <laughs> That's yeah. the, might be their inside joke then. Yeah. Oh, that he's the Elfstone and the lace he's cap got is Elfstone eyes. In, yeah, right. <laughs> Elfstone eyes. Um, uh, it says the lace cap is mentioned in the book too. Yeah, that's great. So you know, here we'll get to the description, the, the details of the description. Um, I'm not sure what to make of her sleevelessness. Yeah. It, it doesn't seem to make sense in the context. Well, in the context of her standing up here at high altitude, no. Yes, uh, yeah. No. Um, though, you know, you know, she... Also, yeah, keep in mind it's tough, December, you know? too. It's also December when she's up here. Because that's when we're supposed to reach Rivendell, is December. Yeah. Uh, Taweth says maybe it's to show off the white arms. Yeah, she does have white arms, doesn't she? Could be. And see, now I want to see how, how do they dress um, Luthien in the statues? We'll have to go look more carefully at Luthien's dress. Mm-hmm. I think they give her bell sleeves, but I'm not positive. <sighs> Is there one in town below? Because I think that's... Um... A statue of Luthien, I meant. A statue of Luthien. Oh, yeah, there's several down below. Uh, in fact, yeah. there's one pretty close by. Um, I kind of want to compare and contrast now. <laughs> yeah, me too. Um, in fact, we should probably go do that. Uh, I don't think we're yeah. going to get to glow in tonight. Um, nah. And one other thing that I I, that I, I, I I think kind of has to be said about Arwen too. I think that she is made to be more of a sexual object than most of the elf elf women too. She, so far, is the only one I've seen with cleavage. With in this cleavage, game. exactly. That's just what I was also thinking. Um, and I think that that's an interesting 
and significant choice. She is Aragorn's bride. She is the... Although her love story with Aragorn is very far from a central theme of the book, nevertheless, she is the heroine of one of the sort of theoretically central love stories, right, of the book. Uh And so as we are asked to sort of retroactively understand, right, that Aragorn and Arwen's romance is really, really important. Um, Uh uh, But, um, uh, and so, you know, in that light, showing her as like an object of desire. Uh Uh-huh. I th- one of the functions of this, it would seem, one of the effects of this, I think, that is to 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 emphasize Arwen's body in this way, right? By showing cleavage, by showing more skin. Again, I mean, like the, we we really do see more of her exposed skin than we do of of any other elf woman I can think of in the game, uh-huh. um, or just woman period. Woman period. Yeah. Um, anyway. Just uh, that fact, one of the effects, I think, is that it kind of puts us in Aragorn's place, right? Invites us to see her as striking, right? See her as standing out. See her, you know, to to have that. She turns to look at us and we're like, whoa, you know. um, To see her womanly virtues. Yes, exactly. Oh, okay. Druid's Fire just posted us a picture. Of a fully oh. sleeved but plunging decolletage luthier. <laughs> yeah. Well, let, let's go, let, let's go look at it so we can show it on, and I will get yeah, yeah. out of oh, yep, yep, Arwen's personal yeah. space. She's got little slippers. I want. I was looking down at her feet too. She's not. Uh, uh, like little Ooh, dancing slippers, right? Uh, um, and at the risk of staring in an inappropriate way at her cleavage i was looking at her necklace it's just a gem right mm-hmm. it almost yep. looks like it could, be, it could be like a little cameo but i think it's a gem uh, mm-hmm. okay anyway sorry yep hi right. again sorry arwin for invading your personal space there um okay let's uh, take our leave Christy, are the do, so? Uh, Christy is saying that there, there are some uh, female brigands that have bare midriffs. Oh yeah, 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 and Brie. Yeah, I've forgotten about that. They they got kind of the they look a bit like Gabrielle from Xena. Right, right, yeah. Okay, but, no, I, but again, I that's remember the Gabrielle that's, brigands. Yeah, but yeah. you you can tell they're kind of dressed for for ease of movement in battle. It's not meant to attract the male gaze. Yeah, yeah, it's not really a salacious thing. Not that I want to accuse Arwen of being salacious, but um, no. Okay, all right. Let's. There was a there was a Luthien statue on a rock near here, but we can't get close to that one. I want to go down to one we can get close to. Yeah. Um, I know there's the one, of course, outside the last homely house. Is there yes, another one I in think, the square? Yeah, it's the one I was. No, it's the one I'm. I can remember. Yeah. I think otherwise we'd just be running around in circles trying to find yeah, it. Yeah, let's just go straight to the last homely house, and then we'll end there. Um. Yeah, bear midriff is is done with arrows flying around. Although I have to say, for all the sins of female armor, I think Lord of the Rings gets an award for having very good female armor in other areas. Uh, yes. Yes. Because protecting your bo- your vital organs should be unisex. Right, exactly, yes. Um, yes. Um, see, just for comparison, look at this elf lady here, right? Fairly uh, typical yeah. elf lady. Um, we get the neckline, right? Uh-huh. There would be cleavage there, but there isn't cleavage there. Um, we don't actually get cleavage. Um, and all the way down to the wrists, nothing off the shoulder. <laughs> kind of like the choker. I never really noticed the choker before. Yeah. But anyway, okay, sorry. 
off to so the yeah thing. i got ahead so yeah just wanted to uh yeah i'll meet you at the statue take a go. glance at a uh real live other non arwen elf woman here mm-hmm. yeah there's also, one standing out here too it's the anniversary vendor they also have Keep awesome her. 80s hairdos it's true Taweth, but you got to think like you know um uh, Courtly in the front, common in the back. Elf fashions, you know, in things like dress and hairstyle, really can't change. Oh yeah, that you gotta frequently. think that. Yeah, you gotta think they're gonna keep the same styles for like sixty years and giving things like you know. Yeah. So Luthien seems to be wearing a no two-piece, time. right? She's got a separate top and skirt going on. It looks like. Mm-hmm. She yeah, has a neckline. Yeah exactly identical to the neckline of that elf woman over there, thus demonstrating that the same fashion has been in vogue since the first age, right? Yeah. Uh, or unless they just depicted her in the current modern fashions uh, uh, in the st- in when they were carving the statue here, but I'd be a little bit surprised by that. Um, uh, you know, I don't know. The, just, yeah. I was looking at Tale of Genji art. There the, are different eras were interpreting a book that was written in the ninth century. Right. Yeah, her um she's wearing slippers, like right, like dancing slippers. I, I love slippers. the lace details on, on the elbows and the wrists and the waistline. Yes. Yes. See that's that's feminine and it's yeah. romantic, but it's not it's salacious, not yes. Salacious. It, it's not it's not sexualized. No, I agree. The um they do very little. I mean, Lotro does very little of, um, you know, extravagant, uh, extravagantly sexualized women, mm-hmm. uh, which is, I agree, very admirable. Um, yes. Katriana, I also would have thought that um, her hair would be much longer. Unless, Katriana, this is a reference this is designed to place her at a particular point. If she were dancing in the woods, if we're seeing Luthien dancing as Baron saw her in the woods, I would think her hair would be very much longer because that's before she cut her hair to make her cloak, right? Uh The fact that her hair is only just below her shoulders, she's kind of tipping her head back. So if her head were forward and her chin down, it would be barely below her shoulders, right? Um, yeah, it's not quite like shadow following. It's something much more ex- uh, brief than that. Exactly. Which means that chronologically in the Luthien story, this would be a scene from later after she flees from Doriath to go and rescue Baron, which means that my um, my vote for what what actual scene is being depicted here, if an actual scene is depicted here, it would be dancing before Morgoth. Ah. Well, it certainly more, makes it a much more heroic statue as well. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Trifle says it would also explain why she's looking up. Yeah. Yeah, it would. Yeah. I never really thought about this before, but um, uh, but yes. Yes, it would. Um, slightly less joyful dance than yeah well I wasn't exactly Belongsmon thinking of a statue of her with Baron um, but that's the other moment right that's the other moment like the other Luthien moment I think that you would want uh-huh. to capture, like I sort of imagine. I admit that's the first thing I always thought of when I uh-huh. um, saw this this statue of Luthien dancing. My first thought was, "This is kind of cool because you come across the statue of Luthien dancing, and it's like Baron coming across her dancing in the wilderness, right?" So, you know, when uh-huh. you when you come here and you know to the last homely house, the first thing you see is like a memory of what Baron saw looking between the trees. Um, yes, so, who is this dancing maiden exactly. <laughs> mystery? So I think that's pretty cool. And I think that I mean, is I think what I always thought about that. it. But yeah, I agree. The hair thing suggests... That, I mean, it, it would still work for that. But uh, the hair thing... Notice even the hair is 
is uneven. Uh-huh. Right? Like, it's not just short. It's short and ragged. As if, like, she yeah. cut it herself, right? It, it's, that's the sort of hairstyle you get if you put your hair in a ponytail and then cut off And the then tail. cut off the ponytail, yeah. Exactly. Yep. Exactly. Which is most likely something like what she did, right? When she cut her own hair and wove the cloak. Um... Now, I know that she, in the story, is able to control the length of her hair. So, you know, to think of her as cutting off her hair and then having to wait for it laboriously to grow back uh, because and, you know, having it look embarrassing for a while is, I know, not really in keeping with the kind of relationship that Luthien appears to have with her own hair uh, in the story. Uh Um, But still, I think it's uh, it's interesting that it seems to evoke that. Um, uh, But anyway... Um, yeah, Belongsmont still thinks that the elves probably wouldn't want to put into stat to capture in the statue, uh, the moment when, uh, you know, the man came and took her away. Um, yeah, yeah. Well, uh, keeping in mind who, who she's related to though. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And she's one of the great heroines of the elven histories. So, yeah. Yeah, no, I think uh, with Morgoth, I think that's je- that's definitely what I want to, especially with the looking up, I like that. So yeah. her face, then, would not be the face of transport, like I'm just dancing and enjoying myself and lost in, you know, the moment of, you know, the music and the dancing. This is the this is the look of defiance, right? Mm. Looking into the face of the yeah, yeah, like and that. slight fear, <laughs> right? Cool. All right. Yep. Awesome. Um, well, I should let everybody go. I ended class yep. late, and now it's even later, so we should stop here. <laughs> um, we will see. I actually would be interested to um, take um, votes. So. We've explored all of Rivendell that I can get to. Um, and Frodo's not even out of bed yet. So uh, we're going to be in Rivendell in the text for the next year or so, um, <laughs> at least. Uh, but um, what would you guys like to do next? There are a few options. We didn't finish Angmar, right? We could go back to Angmar. Uh, we could continue... Um, we could continue up through um, uh, the Misty Mountains, right? We could go back up the because uh, you know we're not going to go to the Misty Mountains, you know, in the text, right? So we won't be following them. Kellandim, yes, uh, Penloth. I was thinking of doing Kellandim because we haven't really done Kellandim. I was kind of mm-hmm. saving that for when we were in Elf Country, so we can do that too. Um, I, my point is, I think we will have time, in fact, to do all of these things while we are doing uh, the next, these next two chapters. Um, So really the question is just what you guys would like to do first of all of those things. So think about it. We can talk about it next time. Um, And uh, 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 we can, uh, we'll, we'll decide next week. Um, Anyway, (laughs) thanks everybody. We'll see you guys next week. Uh, And, um, uh, and thanks for joining me. See you guys later. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thanks for joining me on this epic exploration of The Lord of the Rings and of Standing Stone's video adaptation of Tolkien's story. If you are having even half the fun I'm having on this journey, I hope you will consider supporting the project by donating at signumuniversity.org fund.